now a hearing on U.S. relations with Pakistan and Afghanistan. Assistant Secretary of State Richard Boucher testifies about security issues. In uh, the hearing entitled Pakistan at the Crossroads, Afghanistan in the Balance will come to order. Uh, and I ask unanimous consent that the uh, Chairman and Ranking Minority Member of the Subcommittee make an opening statement, and without objection, that is so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee may be allowed to submit a written statement for the record, without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the following written statement and materials be placed on the hearing record, uh, that of the Honorable Richard A. Boucher, Assistant Secretary of State, Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs, and without objection, so ordered. Uh, for purposes of this hearing, I would like to just put some remarks on the record and then uh, invite Mr. Shays to do the same, and then we would like to go directly to our uh, witness who has been kind enough to join us here this morning. Uh, today we are continuing our sustained oversight of United States policy toward Pakistan. We do it for two fundamental reasons. First, that Pakistan has been and remains absolutely vital for the United States national security. And the 9 11 Commission stressed, and I quote, it is hard to overstate the importance of Pakistan in the struggle against Islamic terrorism. More recently, Fareed Zakaria, among others, has reiterated that Pakistan should be considered the central front in the war on terror. Secondly, Pakistan finds itself at the most important crossroads it has faced in years. And it is absolutely vital that we in the United States Government seize this opportunity to ask ourselves where the current United States policy needs to be reassessed in order to best ensure long-term United States national security interests. Pakistan faces this crossroads as it rounds the bend into upcoming national elections, a crossroads represented by two ongoing dramas. Uh, one, the full-blown judicial crisis precipitated by President Musharraf's suspension of Chief Justice Iftikhar Chowdhury, and two, the fallout from the bloody conclusion to the tense standoff with extremists at Islamabad's Red Mosque. Protests of President Bashar's suspension of the Chief Justice are populated by lawyers and proponents of a robust civil society, judicial independence and democratic rule of law, while those rising in support of the Red Mosque are populated by extremists and jihadis who wish to impose a repressive view of Islam on all Pakistanis. This subcommittee's May hearing focused on the links between Pakistanis' rising tide of extremism and its relation to a failing Pakistani education system. The Red Mosque is merely a stark symbol of a deeper, more pervasive problem in Pakistan, where there are far more jihadist extremist madrasas, al-Qaeda operatives, Taliban safe havens, and international terrorist training camps than Pakistani government officials are willing to admit. In fact, just two months ago, our own State Department concluded, Pakistan remains a major source of Islamic extremism and a safe haven for some top terrorist leaders. And it is vitally clear that extremism in Pakistan is of immediate concern to the United States' interest including its having fueled a resurgence of violence in Afghanistan. The 9-11 Public Disclosure Project warned that President Musharraf, and I quote, has not shut down extremist linked madrasas or terrorist camps. Taliban forces still pass freely across the Pakistan-Afghanistan border and operate in Pakistani tribal areas. And these border groups gained political legitimacy last year when General Musharraf signed a series of dubious peace deals with the Pakistani Taliban. Pakistan's intensifying extremism also has consequences that reach far beyond Afghanistan. The July 7, 2005 London subway terrorist bombings and a later incident involving fertilizer bombs both involved terrorists who had attended Pakistani madrasas and training camps. Due to President Musharraf's, some would say tepid, cooperation in controlling extremism and disrupting terror networks, along with signs that these crises have compromised his grip on power, there is a growing chorus calling for a significant reevaluation of U.S. policy toward Pakistan. This past Monday alone, critical editorials ran in both the Washington Post and the New York Times. The Times noted, and I quote, America needs to maintain friendly relations with Pakistan. That is exactly why Washington should hasten to disentangle itself from the sinking fortunes of General Pervez Musharraf, a blundering and increasingly unpopular military dictator and a half-hearted strategic ally for the United States. The Washington Post editorial stressed their view of the administration's policy this way. Pakistan's Pervez Musharraf is running out of supporters, except in Washington. Today's hearing presents an opportunity to explore a whole slew of critical questions with the administration's point person in Pakistan. For example, where does Pakistan's cooperation against international terrorism stand, especially in light of the spread of jihadi extremism in Pakistan? And what impact does it have on the United States forces and efforts in Afghanistan and elsewhere in the world? Is our current aid package to Pakistan one in which we are providing at least 10 times more for military aid than for basic education systems and the best long-term interest of the United States national security? 
What should United States policy be with respect to Pakistan's civil society in light of the escalating crisis following President Musharraf's dismissal of the Chief Justice of Pakistan's Supreme Court? And what is the United States doing to help ensure that the upcoming Pakistani national elections occur and are free and fair from voter registration through to the voter tally? And what are the consequences for President Musharraf if they are not? The people of Pakistan stand at a crossroads, and the United States' efforts in Afghanistan and the world's success against international terrorism hang in the balance. This Congressman feels that the United States needs to send a powerful message at this critical juncture that we stand shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters in Pakistan in their pursuit of education for their children and democracy for their country. It has often been said that Pakistan is a place of breathtaking complexity. It is in part because of this that our long-term national security interests are best served by forging bonds with the Pakistani people and not necessarily with any one particular leader. I'm pleased that our State Department's Pakistan point person is here with us today in order to present the administration's viewpoint and to engage in what I hope will be a robust, robust discussion. Mr. Chase. Today the subcommittee again discusses serious issues involving Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, and the a broader region. Mr. Chairman, I congratulate you on holding such a timely hearing, timely in light of all eyes having turned towards Islamabad with last week's military action against nearly 2,000 extremists holed up in the Red Mosque. These dynamic developments, and in Pakistan's capital city nonetheless, underscore our need to understand the forces threatening the peace and stability of our allies in South Asia region and our allies across the globe. I look forward to today's hearing as an opportunity to discuss first the effects of extremism in Pakistan, second the effects of USA to Pakistan, three the prognosis for Pakistan's forthcoming elections, and fourth the implications for Pakistan's civil society of President Musharraf's attempted dismissal of the Pakistani Chief Justice. Subcommittee staff recently met with a delegation of provincial leaders from the Afghan side of the Pakistan-Afghan border. These Afghani leaders expressed hope for a peaceful Afghanistan, but stated peace and development cannot be achieved without security. Security cannot be achieved without stricter border enforcement. And strict border enforcement cannot be achieved without cooperation from the Pakistani government and stronger action by President Musharraf. These are strong and insightful sentiments expressed by the Afghani leaders, especially as they are most directly affected by a Pakistani action or inaction. Some strongly question the will and inclination of President Musharraf to stand up to the challenges faced by Pakistan. We hear President Musharraf is thwarting the role of the judiciary. There are indications he is thwarting democracy by not allowing political candidates to return to Pakistan to stand for election. President Musharraf may be turning a blind eye towards the growing ranks of Taliban and al-Qaeda in Pakistan, lacking the ability or will to crack down on terrorist training camps in western Pakistan and stopping the proliferation of jihadists moving across the Pakistan-Afghan border and attacks on coalition forces and Afghan civilians. In fact, some say with confidence that Osama bin Laden is currently in a training camp near the Pakistani-Afghan border, not far from Peshawar. In fact, uh, yet somehow President Musharraf has not been able to find it. So what of all of this is true? If any of it is true, how does the United States justify continuing its seemingly unconditional support for Musharraf's government? And how do we in Congress justify to the American people writing checks for billions of dollars to a regime that may not be the partner against terrorism the United States needs it to be? but may actually be hurting national security interests of the United States and our allies. While many inside and outside Pakistan question President Musharraf's policies, Pakistan remains a strategic U.S. partner in the struggle against terrorism. And we should not forget Pakistan has been a strong support and ally to the United States. That said, our support cannot be unconditional. We look forward to getting answers to some basic questions that go to the heart of protecting the security of this nation and her allies the safety of the United States and coalition forces serving in Afghanistan, and peace and stability around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Uh, we'll now receive testimony from our witness that's with us here today, and I want to begin by introducing uh, the witness in the first panel. Uh, I won't go into the long resume. I think most people are familiar with it, but it's a long and distinguished uh, career as a public servant uh, in, in foreign affairs, and I appreciate that, and we all do. 
I would like to welcome Ambassador Richard A. Bauscher, Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs. Mr. Bauscher, as you know, is the policy of this subcommittee to swear you in before you testify, so I ask that you please stand and raise your right hand. And if any other person is going to be assisting you in testimony, and you are responding, we will ask them also to stand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. I am going to suggest, Mr. Bauscher, that uh, you can recognize that your written remarks are already on the record and be incorporated in there. You feel free to either uh, reiterate them or to speak in an abbreviated fashion. We have five minutes generally for the opening statement. We are going to be liberal with that because of the complexity of the topic, um, but uh, with some mindful of uh, allowing members at some point to be able to get some questions in. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Shays, other members of the subcommittee. It's a it's a great pleasure to be here today, and I I thank you for holding a uh, a hearing that is both topical and timely, um, and uh, I appreciate the effort that you all put into uh, supporting and working with Pakistan and the travel that you've made out there uh, to help further our policy goals. I'd like to uh, give a sort of abbreviated introduction because I'm sure that with the breathtaking complexities that uh, uh, Mr. Sh that you referred to that uh, we'll probably get to a lot of different things during the course of questions. But if I can, I'd like to lay out sort of the basic framework of how we see Pakistan and what we're doing there. Um, as you noted, Pakistan is a vital ally to us in a very broad variety of ways. Our goal is to see that Pakistan succeeds as a democratic nation, a prosperous people, and a moderate Muslim society. Um, first of all, Pakistan is vital to the war on terror. Uh, we all need to do everything we can to prevent attacks that could come from this part of the world. Uh, second of all, Pakistan is vital to the fight in Afghanistan. We all know we won't have stability in Afghanistan unless Pakistan is stable and vice versa. Uh, the militancy, the extremism can move both ways across the border, and that's something that leaders in both Pakistan and Afghanistan recognized. Third, in a more uh, long-term and strategic way, Pakistan is vital to opening up the flow of people, energy, ideas, and trade between South and Central Asia. That's a strategic change that can reverse hundreds of years of history and open up opportunities for the countries of Central Asia as well as South Asia. We have and will have a long and very enduring strategic relationship with Pakistan um, to work together for its success in all these areas. But achieving our goals in Pakistan is going to take time. <coughs> so how can we help Pakistan succeed politically, economically, and militarily? I talk about the four E's, uh, education, economy, energy, and elections. Uh, first, we're supporting the renewal of Pakistan's public education system. Uh, if you look at all the various money we put in through uh, project assistance, through the Fulbright program, through their own budget, uh, it's well over $100 million a year that we put into the reform and, and uh, expansion of education in Pakistan. Uh, and that's a small part of, the own, of, the, of their own efforts to reform and expand their education system. Uh, they have, uh, I think, gone from $1.3 billion a year on education from the federal budget uh, in 2003 to about $2.3 million billion dollars a year. Uh, spent on education from their own federal budget, and our, our assistance uh, helps help support that. Uh, second is the reform and expansion of the economy. The economy is going growing at uh, six, seven percent a year, uh, based on open investment climate, uh, open economy, and that's uh, doing quite well. We want to support and continue that. Uh, the third is helping them support the diversification of their energy supplies. Uh, one of the problems that Pakistan faces, particularly this year, is called load shedding. It's basically brownouts, the cutting of power to a lot of people. And uh, that's one of the things that you see a lot of comment on in the press and in the politics. And we're trying to work with the government, work with other nations to bring energy down from the north in the form of electricity from Tajikistan and other places, uh, as well as to help them develop new sources of energy in coal or uh, alternate energy systems. The fourth E is elections. Um, Pakistan is poised now for a peaceful transition this year from military rule to civilian government. Uh, we are doing everything we can to support a free and fair election. Uh, we have put about $20 million this year into supporting the Election Commission, uh, doing basic uh, poll watcher 
training, political parties uh, training, things like that. Uh, and we've been very active and outspoken in pushing for an open election and, and trying to help uh, um, look at some of the areas where they can do better in terms of making sure that everybody has a choice and that the choices of the voters of Pakistan are respected. Uh, we've also made clear we think this election is important for the body politic of Pakistan, uh, not just for the choices the people have, but in order to form a more stable, moderate center to Pakistani politics, and we've tried to encourage that uh, for the moderates to come together at the center so that they're better poised to fight extremist elements in the society. And that's a fifth E, which is the danger, and that's extremism. It, it flicks Pakistan. It's a threat to the people of Pakistan. It's a threat to the national goals of modernizing Pakistan. This manifests itself in a number of ways, but uh, let me start with the tribal areas. Uh, the tribal areas of Pakistan have never been governed by uh, the same arrangements as the rest of the country. Going back to British days, these were governed under sort of hands-off uh, arrangements, and then during the modern period, those arrangements were never changed. So the doesn't, government doesn't have the full authority and writ in those places. They operate through agents and through tribes. Um, Nonetheless, the government is interested in trying to bring these places into the national system, into the national economy, uh, one of the reasons being to give people alternate ways of earning a living than smuggling and picking up guns. Uh, so they've developed a very comprehensive development plan for the tribal areas. Pakistan government is going to put $100 million a year for 10 years into the development of their, these areas. And we've told them we will come up with $150 million a year for the next five years to support the economic development of the tribal areas. Uh, in addition, we're trying to open up some economic opportunity for the border areas of Pakistan and Afghanistan. And uh, have said we're going to propose to the Congress uh, reconstruction opportunity zones. Uh, we hope that there will be a legislative uh, opportunity for that in the coming months. And we hope that uh, members will support that legislation uh, when it appears, because it's, again, the idea that if you can have economic development in these regions, uh, you can use the economic development to bring people into the national economy uh, and to get them to, to uh, take up uh, different occupations than the ones many of the young men there have been following. The second big thing going on in the tribal areas has been the security efforts. Now, Pakistan, as I said, has been a sh strong ally in the fight against terrorism. They have captured more al-Qaeda than any country in the world, uh, lost more people in doing that. Um, they've been key to the efforts that have made of, been made over the last five years. You've also seen, perhaps over the last six to nine months, more of a focus on the tribal areas of Pakistan, the border areas of Pakistan. And indeed, they've had a number of successes. Uh, several major Taliban leaders have been captured or killed uh, this year so far, uh, Mullah Osmani in January, Sh Mullah Obadullah, Mullah Dudullah Lang. Uh, some of these uh, gentlemen were killed in Afghanistan, but these were all joint efforts with Pakistan uh, that led to the elimination of some of the top Taliban leaders uh, who have been operating from Pakistan uh, to support the, uh, the uh, insurgency in Afghanistan. In addition, you saw earlier this year the tribal leaders with some support from the government turned on the, uh, what they call the Uzbeks, the, uh, some of the foreign militants who have been in these areas associated with al-Qaeda, engaging in trading, engaging in bombing, and uh, engaging in fighting alongside the Taliban. And those, uh, hundreds of those people were expelled from the tribal regions this year with the support of the government. The government has now made clear to the tribes that um, all the foreign elements, the foreign militants, are a danger to the, those areas or a danger to Pakistan and need to be expelled. And you've seen very strong warnings from President Musharraf about two weeks ago in Peshawar from Governor Oryxai, the governor of the Northwest Region, uh, in recent days, uh, warning the tribes that they need to expel the foreigners and not allow the Taliban uh, to cross the border or to cross into the settled areas of Pakistan. And that's been a big concern. Uh, throughout Pakistan that the Taliban were somehow trying to expand their influence into settled areas. So you've seen steps uh, that the government's taken in terms of moving troops into the region, putting up better checkpoints near the borders, 
Um, they've had built more border posts. Uh, they've equipped the people there better, and we've tried to support that, and we'll try to support that as we go on. Another uh, manifestation of extremism that we have seen the government deal with is the Red Mosque uh, controversy. Uh, this mosque is, I think I looked it up on the internet, it was founded in 1965, uh, really grew over the last 20 years uh, into a major center for extremist views, extremist ideologies, and has been uh, uh, accused over the last year or two of many uh, attacks, abductions, uh, forays uh, against policemen or people in society, and really has led to a, you might say, a popular back backlash. A lot of Pakistanis uh, see this activity, a lot of Pakistanis have seen the activity of the Taliban in some of the settled areas, and really risen up and said, no, you know, we want video stores, we want barber shops, uh, we want to have a normal, modern life. Uh, the government uh, tried to contain this problem for a long time, was very reticent about going after the mosque or going into the mosque because of the large numbers of women and children who were there. Um, but they found in the last couple of weeks that they were not able to do that anymore because the militants were coming out and attacking policemen and others uh, and trying to seize weapons. So the government did react. Uh, they've spent the last uh, nine days, I think it is, uh, in a military operation to clear the place out, and it looks like it's pretty much over today. Um, there was some loss of life. We don't yet know the final numbers on how many people might have been uh, killed in the operation. Some soldiers, uh, some militants in the uh, inside the mosque. Uh, but I would say that uh, considering the difficulty of the operation, the scope of the operation, and the uh, um, refusal of the people inside to negotiate and lay down their arms and come out peacefully. Uh, the government did ask with a did, did act uh, with a relative amount of restraint and uh, care as they conducted this uh, this operation. Let me say again, Mr. Chairman, these are all elements in stabilizing Pakistan. Everything from education and energy elections to um, dealing with the problems of extremism. Uh, they're all part of helping the Pakistani people achieve better lives in a more modern society. This is the direction that President Musharraf is leading the nation, and we're proud to work with him. Uh, it's a fundamental direction that's important to us and important to him and important to the Pakistani people. And we work with the government, we work with the people, we work with people, civil society, political parties, uh, who want to lead Pakistan in this direction. Uh, if they succeed, uh, Pakistan can not only be a stable anchor for the region, prosperous nation for its people, but it can also be a model to others in the developing world, uh, particularly in Muslim countries. So it is important that we help Pakistan succeed, especially in making the transition this year to civilian government um, and to uh, a democratic government uh, for its country. And as I said uh, at the beginning, I'm pleased to see the interest of members of Congress and, and very happy to be able to work with Congress as we go forward in trying to achieve these goals. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your time. I'd be glad to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. We, uh, we appreciate your comments and your willingness to uh, have a dialogue with us. I'm going to start. I, uh, Mr. Shays and I were talking at his suggestion. If there's no objection, uh, we might do 10-minute rounds of questioning unless anybody has uh, a pressing engagement elsewhere. Sometimes, as you know, Ambassador, we have other committees going on at I the do. same time. I take the liberty of starting, if I may. Ambassador, do you think that we've got sufficiently broad and deep enough ties to Pakistan to maintain a strategic relationship with that country if President Musharraf were to exit the scene? What are we doing specifically uh, to facilitate ties directly with the, um, the Pakistani people? And what else should we be doing? I think uh, let me say, I think we do uh, have very broad ties in Pakistan to people throughout the society. Uh, we know people all over the country. We have consulates uh, in Lahore, Peshawar, Karachi. Uh, we have people who work down in Quetta, uh, largely on drug enforcement missions, but they work with local authorities down there. Um, whenever I travel there, I meet with a wide variety of people from the political parties of Pakistan. I've, I've met with people from all the political parties of Pakistan, and these are, in fact, regular contacts uh, of our embassy. Um, 
we certainly think the fundamental direction that President Musharraf has been leading Pakistan is one that's uh, compatible with our goals and, frankly, compatible with the major majority of the goal of, with the goals of the majority of the Pakistani people. Uh, but we have uh, very broad outreach to uh, all segments of society. We've been very involved with uh, the development of civil society. Uh, we uh, have close ties with women's groups, with academics, with legal people in the legal profession, some of whom are out protesting, um, and uh, politicians of all stripes. So uh, we do try to make, it, make sure that we have very broad contacts there. I'm going to give you a quote of the author, Ahmad Rashid, who I think you're familiar with. Uh, he had the following quote. To spook the West into continuing to support him, Musharraf continues to grossly exaggerate the strength of the Islamic parties that he warns might take over his nuclear-armed country. In fact, the United States would be far safer if it pushed for a truly representative Pakistani government that could marginalize the jihadist rather than placing all its eggs in Musharraf's basket. Uh, do you agree with that statement? And uh, if not, why not? I, I think he's totally wrong. Um, I think he's wrong in his characterizations. Um, I think his, his policy prescription is exactly right. But um, I think that was the article that he, he mentioned my name in quite a few times. And frankly, the half a dozen things in there that were just flat out wrong. Uh, we don't put all our eggs in one basket. We do support moderation. We don't, uh, I've never heard Musharraf or anybody else uh, exaggerate the strength of the Islamist parties. Uh, most of the people that I've talked to in Pakistani politics, whether they're in government policies or other ones, government parties or other ones, uh, think that because of the distortions of the 2002 elections, the Islamist parties were able to actually gain more seats than they would get and will get in a free and fair election. We'll ultimately see what the voters decide. There have been some by-elections, like the one up in Bajur, uh, where the uh, Islamist parties didn't do that well. So I, I think... Uh, the contention is not made. Um, the idea that we are pushing, uh, that we should push for a uh, more centrist uh, uh, political orientation in Pakistan and work with the parties to try to encourage that uh, is a correct observation, and, but in fact that's what we do and that's what I said in my testimony we do. Yeah, well, I, well, I'm encouraged to hear you say things along yeah. that line. Now, I happen to agree that if you have a legitimate elected government under free and fair elections, the legitimacy is going to better empower you to deal with extremism. Uh, and I think that's why it's important. So I, looking at the election situation, I want to ask you if you've reviewed the National Democratic Institute's USAID-funded review of preliminary voters list. Uh, and if you, I assume that you have. So yeah. what should we do regarding the finding? Uh, and I'm going to go through a basic a number of these. One finding that based on a statistically significant sample size, up to 13 of 52 million entries in the voter polls, uh, rolls, maybe duplicates are incorrect. What should we do about the fact that using that same sample size, up to 16 million eligible voters are yet to be registered? What should we do with regard to the finding that uh, the voter rolls contain vastly fewer numbers than previously uh, elections on a scale suggesting that the reduction cannot be attributed to the uh, deduplication alone? And these are serious issues. When I, when I hear you speak about making sure that the votes are open and transparent, no disagreement there, but tallying the votes on election day is only one part of it. If we don't make sure that they have a list over there from which they're working that it enables everybody to be registered that should be registered that doesn't put up poll taxes or other barriers to getting people elected. I think we're in for some difficulty there. Uh, so on top of asking whether or not you read that poll and respond to that, let me also ask you if you've read uh, former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto's uh, June letter uh, where she laid out, uh, I think, about 10 different uh, issues uh, that were significant that she asked to be in, in your reaction to that as well. Um, yes, sir. I have, uh, I have looked at the National Democratic Institute report. Um, I've seen uh, former Prime Minister Budo's letter. There, her party also did a, a very detailed and extensive analysis of the 2002 election uh, and a lot of the problems that they saw there. And um, we, we've looked at that. We've also looked at other reports on previous elections and what needed to be corrected. So, uh, you know, there are things in there, basic things like transparent ballot boxes. Uh, that they said, uh, you know, really were needed, and that's one of the things we're paying for uh, in Pakistan is to get them transparent ballot boxes, which are harder to stuff. Um, so we've we've tried to take to heart all those things. More important, I think, is we've tried to uh, really encourage the election commission to take those things seriously and to look at all these specifics and deal with them. And when I was in Pakistan last time, I uh, met again with the election commissioner uh, to talk to him about these things. The voter rolls is, is indeed an issue. 
first of all, there was, everybody thinks there was a lot of duplication on the voter rolls. And second of all, everybody thinks there's a lot of people left out. And so at some one point, you've got to reduce the duplication, but you've got to register all the unregistered people. Um, there were issues over ID cards that seemed to have been settled. But really, people, the parties need to be able to go through these lists and make sure that they're accurate and check their voters, check their precinct voters, and check for duplications. And but if I can interrupt, but that's not being done. I mean, well, clearly, as recently as yesterday, uh, conversation with people over there that that is not being done and, and there's still considerable concern about that. It's being done in some ways and not others. Uh, it, the voter lists are now published at election centers. There are display centers where the voter lists are on display in a particular precinct. And I went uh, uh, in uh, Quetta to one of those display centers at a school. And they have them there. And anybody can come in and look and make sure my name's on and make sure other names aren't on five times. To do that in a nation of uh, 50 to 70, 70 million voters is, is pretty hard, and particularly when you're doing it across places. And so we have pushed, uh, encouraged the Election Commission to make these uh, lists available in CD form and computerized form so the parties can go through them more thoroughly and, and use modern technology uh, to try to identify lapses and lacunae. And, and at this point, um, you know, they talk about it, they haven't done it. We keep pushing. Okay. Well, I, I hope that you'll continue to keep pushing because I think those yeah. elections are not going to be able to be term free and fair unless we get yeah. that resolved. And given all the money that USAID and the United States is putting into the elections, sure. we're going to be the ones that sure. are going to be arguably complicit, yeah. or at least people are going to say that we're complicit yeah. in not having uh, made that happen. I, can I add one more thing? Sure. There's, there's a lot of discussion right now in Pakistan among the political parties about having all the parties get together and agree on basic code of conduct and rules, guidelines for the election. Uh, we think that would be a very good thing. We've tried to encourage that with all the parties. Right. And I hope, which hasn't been done yet, encouraging the Election Commission to have those parties at the table and be able to work off of any complaints or suggestions that they have. Absolutely. Which is not I, happening that either. was one of the first things I said in my first meeting with the Election Commissioner last year. Now, in your written testimony, you said, uh, that I quote, you reiterated your resolve, or President Musharraf reiterated his resolve to stop Talibanization in the frontier areas. And you said the government of Pakistan has developed a comprehensive strategy to combat terrorists and extremists <clears throat> by integrating these ungoverned spaces into the mainstream of Pakistan's economy and government. I have to tell you, that, you know, after having been there and, and had witnesses here in other hearings, what went on in the Wazaristan agreements clearly looks to be fair failed policy. Uh, have you had that conversation with President Musharraf? Does he recognize and acknowledge that that's been an extremely failed policy and reiterated again just yesterday? Uh, by our own uh, uh, individuals testifying in front of another committee, uh, telling us that they see a worse condition there than before the agreements, uh, that, that not enough is being done. Um, I, I think we all recognize that the agreements in, in North Waziristan hasn't worked. Um, and the, um, the basic framework, because the government doesn't have direct control, um, they thought they could go and sign an agreement with the tribal leaders uh, that was based on three key premises. One is no foreigners, no foreign militancy. Two is no cross-border activity. And three is no infiltration into subtle areas. That was a presence of the premise of the agreement that was signed in September. Um, by November, December, we and others uh, realized it wasn't working. In fact, lifting the checkpoints had led to probably more freedom of movement and something of an influx of Al-Qaeda people uh, into that area that was of, of serious concern to us. Um, President Musharraf recognizes that as well and has said so in public as well as in, in meetings. Uh, so what they've done since then is to try to um, call the tribes to account to make it work. Um, and that was uh, part of what they did in uh, December, January before they moved against the Taliban and the Uzbeks in the area. And as part of what he's done again in his recent statements and General Orksai's recent statements to the tribes, that they need to expel all the foreigners, including the Al Qaeda Arabs. Thank you. And my time is up, and I'm going to uh, pass on to Mr. Shays. I just want to say, in, in the contest between the Uzbeks, uh, we were there pretty much when that was happening, and, and uh, we had some fairly good accounts from a number of different sources that it was more like one Taliban group fighting another Taliban group, and the government finally decided to weigh in. But. I'd like to explore that a little bit more with you later on. Mr. Chase. Thank you. If you just go to Mr. Duncan, and I might take some of his time. Certainly. Mr. All Duncan. Right. Well, thank you, uh, 
very much, Mr. Chairman, for calling this important hearing, and thank you, Mr. Shays, for coming to me first. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, like uh, I'm sure most members, I've read uh, a few thousand pages of articles, reports, uh, news stories, excerpts from books about Iraq over the last five years. I've read far less about, and I've been to Iraq once, not like Mr. Shays, who's been there, I think, 15 or 16 times, but uh, I've never been to Pakistan or Afghanistan, and I know far less. I've come here <coughs> mainly to learn here today, and I, I know most of your testimony so far has been about Pakistan. The hearing is entitled Pakistan at the Crossroads, Afghanistan in the Balance. I'm wondering, what, can you tell us what is the total U.S. presence in Pakistan and Afghanistan at this time, counting civilian government personnel, military personnel, and U.S. government contractors? Do you have any rough guess? Um. <laughs> I think uh, I think somewhere in my briefing book I have some exact numbers, but um, the, the in Afghanistan the in, uh, in, in U.S. Both, really. the, I, I'm asking about both countries, yeah. Pakistan and so Afghanistan. So let me let me do it piece okay, by sure. piece, and then go ahead, uh, and then we can try to add them up. Um, the uh, uh, U.S. forces in Afghanistan are now about 26,000. There's about 46,000. U.S. and NATO forces together. And in fact, um, we not only have more NATO troops in Afghanistan than we did a, a couple years ago, but we have more U.S. troops even than when NATO started to deploy. So some of the feeling over the last couple of years, maybe the U.S. was leaving, NATO was coming in, uh, is just wrong. We've had uh, an expansion of our forces, an expansion of their area of operations, which has been very important. Um, I'd have to get an exact number on the number of civilians that we have. Uh, we have, you know, several hundred uh, at our embassy. Uh, we have uh, people out in the PRTs. Um, I think a couple dozen uh, of the uh, uh, provincial reconstruction teams are, are have Americans in them, uh, including American staff ones. I can get you the exact numbers on that. In Pakistan, we have. Um, a, about, I think, 350 regular personnel uh, assigned to our embassy and associated with our embassy. As I said, we have consulates in Lahore, Karachi, Peshawar. Uh, we have drug enforcement personnel and some others down in uh, Quetta uh, at the, the air wing down there. Uh, some of those are contractors. And then at any given moment, we have several hundred uh, temporary duty people. Uh, in Pakistan, so you probably have at any moment maybe six to seven hundred uh, U.S. officials working in uh, Pakistan. But again, I'd have to get you more exact numbers. All right. On well, that I too. would appreciate it if you would submit that uh, information, and then uh, a similar and related question. Uh, uh, you've you've mentioned that we've uh, we've promised 150 million over the next five years for a total of 750 million for the uh, for economic development in the tribal areas. We're spending. Uh, 100 million on uh, a year on education. 20, you mentioned 20 million at another time. Uh, we've we've been given several articles. One articles one article mentions that um, that um, Vice President Cheney um, um, apparently uh, expressed some concern about the f that we were that this Congress might cut military aid that we're giving to the uh, Pakistani military. Can you tell me how much military aid we're giving and, and, and what, what I'm wondering about, do you have any idea about how much we're spending on a yearly basis on everything put together, contractors, military, civilian, how much we're spending in Pakistan on a yearly basis total? Um, we spend... Aid, direct and indirect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we spend $738 million this year on assistance programs. About 300 million of that goes to military assistance. Uh, the rest is economic assistance, uh, including things like education, economic reform, uh, some health programs, uh, earthquake relief and reconstruction programs. Uh, you know, a bit of emergency relief money we found after the uh, cyclones hit uh, Pakistan recently. Uh, so that's 738. Uh, the bulk of which, bulk, 60 percent of which is economic. Um, 
there is an addition. It's not assistance. It's reimbursements. Uh, we reimburse the Pakistani military through coalition support funds for the for the uh, their costs in uh, uh, in supporting the war on terror and stationing troops and moving them around and gasoline and in bullets and training and uh, other costs that they incur uh, as part of the war on terror. And so that's. Uh, um, that's an additional amount that uh, the Pentagon have to get you, but uh, that comes to probably in the range of $100 million a month. It's a lot of money. But they have 85,000 troops stationed to the border areas, and, and we pay for that support. But that's reimbursements. So we're, we're paying all their troops to, for their work in... We, we sub I, wouldn't, I, don't, I don't know if it comes to the whole amount of their expenses, but we support their expenses, yeah. Is, is there is there any other country in the world that's d coming anywhere close to doing what we're doing in Pakistan and Afghanistan that you no. can think of? No. The other countries are uh, more and more involved. The British have stepped up their aid program. The European Union has just uh, come forward with some money, uh, but in uh, in, a, in a smaller range than ours. Uh, we we've been given a lot of articles uh, from various publications. One article is entitled Pakistan's Shaky Dictatorship. And, and do, you, do you think that um, uh, most people in Pakistan uh, uh, regard us as a, a neutral power broker or peacemaker? Or, uh, or do you think that the most of them, uh, uh, or many of them, see us as uh, propping up a, a shaky or, or corrupt dictatorship? I think. Uh, uh, most people see us as supporting a, a, a moderate and modernizing force in society, which includes President Musharraf. It includes some of the political parties um, who push in that direction. Um, and it certainly includes all the people who look for a free and fair election, a free press, growth of civil society, all those things that we have been helping with and working with over the years. Um, I do think that uh, uh, the majority in Pakistan is headed in a moderate and Muslim, modern direction. Uh, they want the education. Uh, they want the free election. Uh, they want the open press. You know, they've gone from one TV station eight years ago to 42 or 44 now. Um, so a lot of changes, positive changes in the economy and the society in Pakistan. I think most people want that to continue. And most people do associate us with those things that have happened. Uh, and with the idea that those uh, that that progress needs to be continued. Well, one last question: uh, uh, the State Department's polls over the f uh, last few years, except in the uh, Kurdish areas in Iraq, have shown that two thirds or three fourths of the Iraqi people want us to leave or not occupy the country. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, ha has the State Department taken polls in Pakistan or Afghanistan, and and what? Uh, what percentage of the people would you estimate in those two countries uh, see us or look at us in a favorable light, or would what would polls um, show on that? Uh, on that? I don't, I, I don't, I can't recall anything specific about Pakistan polling that I've that I've seen. Um, in Afghanistan, I've seen polls that indicate that President Karzai uh, continues to have very strong support in the. 60 or 70 percent range that uh, people do support the government. Uh, they turned out to vote for it. Uh, they voted for president and parliament, and they like that. Um, and so there's still very strong popular support there and support for the U.S. presence. That naturally, they have concerns. They have concerns about uh, some of the operations and civilian casualties that have been associated with those. Uh, they have concerns that government's not delivering what they expect from government. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, you know incumbent on all of us not just to take for granted what it may say in the polls, but look at the areas uh, where we can do better, and, and that's something we do try to do. Well, of course, I know they would. Cer they certainly want our money. I yield back uh, uh, my time to Mr. Well, Shea. if I could take your last 30 seconds, Mr. Basher, I'm going to go t uh, speak on the House floor on the rule on, the, on Iraq, and I will be back. I think this is an extraordinary, important. Uh, hearing, and I compliment my colleagues for participating and thank them all for being here. I'll be back. Thank you. Mr. Cooper, recognize the 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to thank you for this timely and topical hearing. 
our witness, Ambassador Boucher, is a diplomat, and he's done an excellent job of putting a positive spin on U.S.-Pakistani relationship. I worry, though, that the average American who occasionally reads the international section of the newspaper looks and sees a country they don't know much about that's on the other side of the world. And they may have seen the Angelina Jolie movie, A Mighty Heart, but that might be the limit of their knowledge of Pakistan. But if they read the newspaper articles, they see that they're probably harboring Osama bin Laden, who, according to our U.S. military, is still rated as about our number one enemy in the world, they're probably harboring Mullah Omar, the Taliban. We know they're harboring A.Q. Khan, the world's leading nuclear proliferator. I ask myself, is there anything else they could do to harbor an international bad guy? And yet, they're still listed as a strong ally of our country. And we're still, as my colleague from Tennessee pointed out, giving them extraordinary amounts of aid, both military and domestic. And here you are, a perfectly nice, calm diplomat, talking about holding elections in Pakistan when also in your testimony you admit much of the country is ungoverned space, tribal areas that the government doesn't even pretend to claim. And yet we're holding elections? Uh, the chairman just pointed out that, what, 12 million of the names on the rolls are duplicates or faulty or... And I know you have to work with what you've got, but... <laughs> There seems to be a disconnect here. How can you solve this problem of cognitive dissonance? Well, I mean, I solve it personally by reading all the newspapers, uh, and not just a couple. Because in the end, Mullah Omar is somewhere in that border region. If you've ever flown over it, you've seen, you know, vast deserts, uh, sort of hole in the wall canyon where the people can hide out. You've seen enormous mountains uh, where people can hide out. And you've seen parts of the country, not large parts of the country, parts of the country where the government doesn't hold sway. Um, Mullah Omar is probably out there somewhere. Bin Laden is probably out there somewhere. Uh, but we are capturing the bad guys. If you read, have been reading the papers about Pakistan for years, you may remember that Ramzi Youssef and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed were picked up there, that they've consistently picked up al-Qaeda people, that they've lost people doing that. You may have seen that uh, Mullah Obadullah was picked up in Pakistan, and Mullah Dadullah Lang, top leader of the Taliban from Quetta, was, was uh, uh, killed in, in Afghanistan, um, in part with the help Pakistanis provided us. Uh, you may have seen press reports last week that indicated they'd picked up several more top uh, Taliban people associated with Mullah Omar. So this is a constant effort. It's a constant effort. There's good stuff going on. There's bad stuff going on. There's a lot of turmoil. There's breathtaking complexity. And it is sometimes hard to sort out. I'm still trying to decide whether you're being moderate and fair or whether you're just making excuses. I'm trying to look at the whole picture. Yeah. If they're able to harbor three of the world's international outlaws. How many more can they harbor and the State Department would still approve of their behavior? Is this an open invitation, a Motel 6 for terrorists in Pakistan? I don't, I don't where think. Where they can come and it's always okay and we're doing the best we can? No. Um, it's a, you know, a few days after September 11th, um, this administration put very blunt choices in front of the Pakistanis and said, are you going to fight these guys or not? And they said, yes, we're going to fight those guys. And they've done that. And they've done that for five years. Now, they haven't gotten everybody, frankly, nor have we gotten everybody on the Afghan side. So we're always working together. We're always talking to them. What, what's next? What do we need to do? Where can we go? How do we cooperate across the border? Um, and. That's a constant effort. That's what Vice President Cheney has been out there doing this year, Secretary Gates, um, Deputy Secretary Negroponte. Let me ask a different question. Are you confident that the State Department is even kept in the loop 
of what America is really doing in Pakistan? Yes. I know this is an open hearing, so we can't talk about current events, but let's talk about some history. The book Charlie Wilson's War, a movie's coming out on that, and then maybe Americans will tune in what happened. Were you aware at the time that Congressman Charlie Wilson from Texas was funneling billions of dollars in aid to the Mujahideen? Um, I, I wasn't working in this area at the time, so no, I probably wasn't. Uh, it Were was, you aware that? I've, I've read a lot of accounts of it, and I look forward to seeing the movie. Congressman Charlie Wilson was apparently made a general in the Pakistani army. I've, due I've to read his things like that, yeah. Money shipments to Pakistan? Yeah. A Texas congressman was made a general in the Pakistani <laughs> army, given a uniform? And the only condition, according to the book, is that he was asked not to wear the uniform while he was in Pakistan. But apparently, in any other country on earth, he could parade around in a Pakistani general's uniform. Was the State Department aware of that? I don't know if we were aware at the time, sir. I, don't, I just don't know. I mean, it's certainly, you know, if you read Ghost Wars, that kind of stuff is talked about there. I'm not sure if that particular incident is in the book. I know it's in other books, so. Um, but a lot of that stuff has come out. I mean, let's remember, you know, we were all together from 79 to 89 fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan with the Mujahideen, with the Pakistanis, with the ISI, with the Saudis. Um, a lot of what we're dealing with now came out of that period. The question is not what did we all do back then. The question is what are we doing now? Well, let's talk about what are we doing now. Um, I haven't heard much from Karen Hughes lately. Is she still the America's public face to the Islamic world? Well, she's she's organizing America's public faces to the Islamic world. But yeah, we talked. To, I talked to her just this morning about Pakistan. Hmm. Are we producing results? Is American approval going up in the Muslim world? Um, I, I, it's a hard question to answer, sir. Uh, in some places, we, we do have very strong approval. In others, we have very dismal Can uh, you remind approvals. me some places in the Muslim world where we have strong approval other than among the Kurds? Um, well, that is in the Muslim world. but. Uh, Afghanistan, I think, you know, people are still very supportive of the U.S. effort there. Um, I don't, as I said, I haven't really seen polls in Pakistan, but I think a lot of people understand what we're doing and are supportive of what we're doing there. You haven't uh, those seen are places polls in, in my Pakistan, region. and this is your account? I, I'm afraid I, it's not one of the things I look at on a regular basis. Maybe I should, but I have not uh, tried to track things through polls. I've tried to keep in touch with a lot of people throughout society and try to understand their opinions. Can you remind me how many predecessors there were to Karen Hughes? Wasn't there a Charlotte Beers? Weren't there several folks who were? A number of people have had the job. Uh, Can you recall how many in the last six years? I was acting at one point, um, <laughs> so I don't know if you count that. Uh, there was Charlotte. There was uh, um, uh, Margaret Tautweiler. I'm, I'm, I'm hate to do this because I'm probably leaving so somebody else. And there right was there. Karen. Charlotte, you, Margaret, Karen. I was more nominal than effective, but anyway, yeah. Well, that's an interesting self appraisal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what can America be doing to be more successful in this region? Sir, I, as you know, and I know why you're asking these questions because I did spend a long time as spokesman at the State Department. I've tried to grapple with these questions over the course of my career many times. Um, I, frankly, I start with the premise that good policy makes good press. You've got to do good things. Uh, you've got to help people get safety and justice and economic opportunity and education for their kids. And the more of that you do, the more in the long run people will appreciate you. Uh, and you have places like India where we have enormously positive approval ratings. I think it's largely because we offer educational and economic opportunity to people and their children. So that's the premise that I start with, and that's where my focus is now. It sounds like your theory is that American foreign aid makes us popular. The taxpayer has limited patience. I understand that. Um, but I think also the taxpayer has a very strong interest uh, in seeing these parts of the world stabilize, in taking away the ungoverned spaces and letting government gain control there. 
and in helping people whose frustrations lead them to horrible acts of violence. But the American taxpayer, I think, also wants results. And to see three of the world's most wanted international outlaws, like, we're still not even allowed to interview A.Q. Khan, right? He's under house arrest. The network well, has we're been not destroyed. Allowed to talk no, we don't. We don't have direct access, but we've gotten uh, good cooperation on that. And frankly, the the he's out of business. The network's been destroyed. But we don't know how many nations he sold the technology to. I think we've had good cooperation, and they provide a lot of information to the International Atomic Energy Agency. Mm -hmm. I see that my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your holding this uh, very important hearing and very timely hearing. Um, Mr. Secretary, I don't want to be too repetitive uh, and apologize for missing some of the early questions um, and coming in late. Um, in looking back to the events of, of September 11, 2001, and uh, President Bush's address to the nation on September 20th um, from the, the House of Representatives, he spoke about the importance of countries making a choice. They're either on the side of good against um, al-Qaeda and, and the terrorist efforts or um, uh, on the side of evil uh, and siding with them, but they need to make a choice. And, and President Musharraf, and, and on behalf of his nation, made a choice and, and uh, said we will no longer stand with the Taliban and recognize them, and we will now stand with the United States and uh, other nations around the world against Taliban, al-Qaeda, and their efforts um, in, um, in having attacked us and, and seeking to do harm to others as well. In him making that choice, that certainly was um, an important one for his country and for us in having their assistance. Given the current environment uh, in the uh, federal uh, uh, overseen tribal areas of western uh, Pakistan, is the choice he made in the days after September 11 still um, valid in how it's impacting our national security given the um, sanctuary that we now see occurring in western Pakistan? I, I think the choice is still there. The commitment is still there. The intention is still there. Uh, is it fully effective? Uh, no, not yet. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we work with them. We follow this closely. We follow the intelligence closely. Um, they've done, they've been able to get at a lot of the top al-Qaeda figures who have been in and out or in Pakistan um, over the years. Uh, they've had, as I said, some success in the tribal areas with Taliban leaders. Uh, they've had some success in the tribal areas against a few of the training camps and madrasas. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, this, uh, this area has been infested with extremists of all kinds, and they've gotten some of them, but certainly not all. It, it's my understanding from, from the recent threat assessment that's been, been done regarding Pakistan that Al Qaeda's efforts, uh, Al Qaeda's efforts in Pakistan to kind of re-energize itself were not successful um, uh, until um, recently in following the t December 2006 agreement between President Musharraf and the tribal leaders that he would remove his military uh, presence from those areas and rely on the tribal leaders and, and their colleagues to uh, self govern to uh, self um, um, patrol, I guess, uh, that region and not allow it to become a safe haven. Um, given that that apparently is not working, um, what indications, if any, do we have from President Musharraf that uh, he's going to take a different approach in that region? And <coughs> if, if there is no different approach being discussed, um, is it um, something that we need to then look at? Um, how to uh, take action to ensure the uh, security of our nation because of his not maybe lack of commitment or, or interest in doing so, but inability to do so. The, uh, I think it was misreported in the paper. The agreement was actually last September, and um, by about December of 2006, they had realized, we had realized, that the agreement wasn't working, and the tribes were not effectively dealing with the foreigners and the Taliban that were in their midst. And so what we've seen over uh, the early part of this year was an effort on the part of the tribes supported by the government to expel some of the Taliban, and, and we were 
with, with Pakistani help, we were able to get some of the very top leaders of the Taliban who had operated out of Pakistan and to expel the Uzbeks, Chechens, and, and hundreds of others uh, who had been in those areas. President Musharraf made a speech about two weeks ago up in uh, Peshawar to a jirga of the tribe saying we have to get all the foreign militants, the Al-Qaeda and the Arabs as well, and we have to stop the Taliban, the sort of what you might call the Pakistani Taliban, the ones who are not only supporting the Taliban and cross-border, but also trying to infect the, uh, um, the settled areas of Pakistan. And so that, that seems to be the direction that he's headed now, and we've, we've uh, keep in close touch with them about that. Is he, um, his actions regarding the Red Mosque um, in just the past uh, days um, a positive indication of him being more aggressive and going after the extremist in his country? I think it's a very positive indication that he's serious about dealing with the problem of extremism and that he has popular support in trying to do that. The, the, um, my, my hope is that the, the actions he's taken with the Red Mosque and, and your statements uh, of um, renewed efforts of working with the tribal leaders um, resulting in uh, efforts to uh, capture um, key uh, terrorist leaders is, is going to fulfill itself in a, in a greater sense in the, in the weeks and months ahead. I, I know when um, Congressman Steve Lynch uh, led our delegation uh, to Afghanistan in April, uh, one of our visits was down to one of our, our forward outposts um, on the uh, Pakistan-Afghanistan border. Um, and, and clearly, um, you know, in the briefings we received, uh, the, the threat coming in from Pakistan is a daily constant threat. And, and it seems uh, a little um, illogical, I guess, to me, that if we know where the enemy is uh, and we have an ally that is, you know, the host country of that enemy and they're not able to address the, uh, the daily threat, that that arbitrary border uh, should not prevent our military from doing what it needs to do to not just um, protect themselves and go after the, the source of, of the daily attacks, uh, but in the broader picture, uh, better secure our, our nation's uh, safety, the citizens' safety. Um, and, and, you know, if, if Musharraf is going to, uh, if President Musharraf is going to follow through, obviously it's uh, appropriate that we work with them, but if not, I think we need to rethink how we're dealing with that tribal area uh, for the uh, safety of our soldiers there and their courageous work in Afghanistan and then ultimately our safety here. Um, I, I want to ask uh, one other uh, area, um, and, and that deals with the um, given reports of Taliban, Al Qaeda kind of reemerging and, and strengthening in the um, western region of Pakistan. Um, my understanding is that uh, Britain, Denmark, Germany, a number of countries have a pretty free flow of, of their citizens between their countries and Pakistan. Um, those countries are also part of the, our, our visa uh, waiver program. Is there uh, a renewed look on how we're operating our visa waiver program with those countries given their interactions with Pakistan? Sir, I think it is something that the, uh, the appropriate people do look closely at, but um, I haven't been involved in those discussions, so I can't give you any more detail. Uh, it's something that if, if uh, on behalf of the department you could follow up with the committee, uh, Mr. Chairman, if that would be okay to make the request on behalf of the, of the committee to, uh, to have the secretary follow up with, uh, with us on that issue. So, uh, Ambassador, is that something you're able to do? Glad to. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, in, in conclusion, um, Mr. Secretary, I, I, I want to thank you for your efforts and uh, don't want uh, by my questions to imply that I don't appreciate your service to our country and your colleagues at the department um, uh, here stateside and, and, uh, and in some very dangerous uh, parts of the world um, and working on behalf of their fellow citizens. We certainly appreciate your patriotic and dedicated service. So, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Higgins, you're recognized for 10 minutes. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just, a um, couple of brief questions, really. I, you know, I'm just trying to get my arms around this, this situation. What always amazes me about, you know, the Middle East is its relative youth, uh, including Pakistan. And, and I think the real fight uh, against terrorism is, is 
a fight for the imagination of, 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 of the youth of the Middle East, and including areas like uh, Pakistan, relative to uh, giving them a, a, a better sense of what their future, not what, it, what, what they know it to be, but what it can be, uh, dealing with the potential. Uh, is it safe to say that, that the basis for fundamental terrorism, uh, Al-Qaeda and Taliban, is located along the, the Afghan-Pakistan border? I think it's, the, the answer is yes, with, you know, I'm sure others would be more precise on the wording, that there is considerable activity of the Taliban uh, in those border areas of Pakistan. There's considerable al-Qaeda presence, including training, some of the command and control. Uh, but as I said, I think they're under pressure. It's not the only place that they operate. Certainly al-Qaeda people have been picked up in Karachi and, and uh, other parts of Pakistan. Um, and it's not just the tribal areas, but it does cut down to Quetta and the Baluchistan border area has been a center of activity as well. Let me put it another <coughs> way. The, the, the al-Qaeda base that has emerged in Iraq, the origin of that, is it safe to conclude, is Pakistan and Afghanistan. I don't, I don't think that would be precisely as accurate. I'd have to ask the intelligence folks to, uh, uh, to do that in more detail. Then where would, where, where would be the origin of that, that, that al-Qaeda presence in, in, in Iraq then? Well, I think they've come from a lot of places and gathered there, and, and to some extent the base comes from there. They do have uh, some ties with al-Qaeda in, uh, in other places, including the al-Qaeda who are in Pakistan, and there's a significant presence that's still there. Uh -huh. The, uh, does the United States' continued support for Musharraf hurt us in the eyes of the 165 million people uh, that live in Pakistan? I mean, he is a military dictator. Uh, he is increasingly becoming more unpopular. Um, I, think, I think people understand that we have a lot of interests in Pakistan. We have interests in fighting the war on terror, keeping our country safe and their country safe. We have interests in building the economy and building the education system. Um, we have interest in elections and seeing a free and fair election. Uh, we work with President Musharraf and his government on all those things. He is a military ruler and that's the government that's there. Uh, but we also have very close ties with all the people in the political parties. Um, and I think people by and large understand that our goal is much is a strategic one and a broader one. And I know people often say, well, the U.S. supports Musharraf. Well, yeah, we do support Musharraf, but that's part of our overall support for Pakistan and the course that Pakistan as a nation is set upon. Uh, final thought on this. Uh, the, the, The pronouncements of this administration relative to um, essentially what amounts to a zero tolerance uh, policy concerning those who harbor terrorism, uh, there seems to be a, a fundamental disconnect here that all the intelligence, including especially the most recent intelligence, conclude that a big problem for us, a big problem for the free world is what is going on in these training camps. Pakistan, despite Musharraf's tough talk, seems to be facilitating not only the growth, but the strength of what threatens the United States primarily, and I think the free world generally. How does the administration reconcile this? I mean, I know that there's a duplicitous nature in terms of foreign policy, particularly in, in the Middle East, but it seems to me that uh, Pakistan has made some, some early commitments to the United States relative to our fight against terrorism, and yet concurrently seems to be, or if it's, if it's not intentional, uh, very ineffective in, in suppressing uh, the growth and the strength of, of 
the Taliban and, and, and Al Qaeda? I think, sir, we, we, we look at what they're trying to do and we look at how we can help them do it more effectively. Um, we look at the fact that they've picked up hundreds, hundreds of Al Qaeda yeah. over the last few years. We look at the fact that they've captured three, uh, helped us capture or kill the three out of the top ten Taliban commanders in the last six months. Uh, we look at the fact that they just the other day, according to press reports, they picked up several more top Taliban commanders. Uh, we look at the fact that they've uh, helped the tribes expel the Uzbeks, who were a source of great trouble training uh, and, uh, and, and fighters uh, who'd been in that area. We look at the fact that they've, um, uh, they've attacked madrasas, they've attacked training camps where these foreign fighters are being trained. Um, there's been a lot of activity up in that area. Yeah, but you know, uh, the, but there's a lot to do. The, the former Secretary <coughs> of Defense, I always remember, had said that you know the, the 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 measure of success in the war on terrorism uh, is. And this was several years ago. Are we capturing? Are we detaining? Are we stopping more terrorist activity every day than is being created? And I think this most recent. Uh, intelligence report is a refutation of uh, the effect of the strategy as advanced by this administration because there's one thing that sticks out in all of this and that is that again intelligence reports are concluding that al-Qaeda, the Taliban are at pre-9-11 strength levels. And to me, uh, it all adds up to the same conclusion, and that is that our fight has been highly ineffective. Uh, the pronouncements of, of the, the Secretary of Homeland Security this week uh, about, you know, the heightened threat. Uh, you know, obviously, I would disagree with any conclusion that we have been effective. Uh, in our efforts uh, to undermine the strength and the growth of the terrorist threat? Um, I, I don't, I haven't seen the, the report that the newspapers all seem to be talking about right now, so I can't give you the full intelligence assessment. Uh, my own view is that this is a difficult and long process. Uh, the chief threat to all of us has been ungoverned spaces. That's what Afghanistan was with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda operating from their place where no reasonable government had sway. Uh, and that's how we were attacked on 9-11. Um, and our job, whether it's militarily or diplomatically, uh, is to get government cooperation, government control of the ungoverned spaces in the world. We've done that militarily in Iraq and Afghanistan, or doing that still militarily in Iraq and Afghanistan. We've also done it diplomatically with our work with, uh, you know, Yemen and Sudan and Libya and a whole bunch of other places. Uh, but it's a constant and long-term effort. The government of Pakistan has never had full control over all its territory and is trying to extend its control. The government of Afghanistan is trying to extend its control and we're a, a major part of that. But until we can help those governments provide good governance and the benefits of good governance, as well as the control of good governance to all its territory, uh, there's still going to be a threat against us. And that's what we have to work very hard to get rid of. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Burton, you're recognized for 10 minutes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a very timely hearing. Uh, I, I listened to my colleagues. Some of them are evidently very critical of what the administration is doing. And I, I hope that they're aware that uh, George Washington was criticized the same way and they wanted to remove him from leadership during the Revolutionary War. He was also criticized when the Jay Treaty was signed. Abraham Lincoln was going to be defeated without any question by McClellan because the war wasn't going well until Sherman took uh, Atlanta. So in every war, I think with almost out exception, uh, there have been people who've been very critical of incumbent presidents when things weren't going well, and I think this is no exception because things haven't been going well. I would like to say to my colleagues that Senator Lieberman, who is a 
centrist Democrat, has been over to Iraq a number of times, as many of us have, and uh, he uh, has said very clearly that in Iraq, if we don't deal with the training camps in Iran, that uh, we're going to uh, see a, a, a continual problem over there. And that if we pull out of Iraq uh, with all this going on, that there'll be a vacuum created which uh, will be filled by the radicals. Uh, and uh, uh, it'll become a training ground, not just in Iran, but throughout Iraq for additional terrorism throughout the world. Now, regarding Pakistan, uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Secretary Boucher, what would happen if we didn't have an ally, ally like uh, President Musharraf over there? In your opinion? I think if, if Pakistan was not fighting terrorism, uh, there'd be no way we could succeed in Afghanistan or in terms of the security of our homeland. Well, Musharraf is a major part of our fight to uh, stop the Taliban and the terrorist training camps over there, is he not? Absolutely. And, and he's it, been a good partner in doing that. And there have been a number of uh, uh, Taliban leaders, as you said, that have been captured, killed, and just recently they were captured. Over the months and, and even in recent weeks. And President Musharraf, because of this, in large part, has had a number of assassination attempts on him, has he not? Uh, and some of the militants in the, uh, in the mosque, uh, you saw al-Zawahri uh, just yesterday was threatening uh, Musharraf uh, because he's fighting on the side of, uh, 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 well, fighting against extremism. Let me also ask you about uh, Mr. Khan. Uh, have we, and this may be classified and we'll have to get it some other way, <laughs> Has, uh, has he been questioned by any of our intelligence people? And do we have any intelligence information on what technology and uh, other nuclear information he may have given to Iran or other countries like Libya? Um, I, think, uh, I think we've said in public that uh, we have not had direct access to Mr. Khan, but we've had a good, we've had good cooperation from the Pakistani of authorities. We've had uh, a good flow of information to the international community, us, other countries, International Atomic Energy Agency, and that we are uh, confident that based on that information we've been able to put the network out of business. I, I really appreciate you stressing that uh, uh, there's so much wild or vacant land there in the mountainous region that it's very difficult to, uh, to uh, take care of all the areas uh, and get this thing completely solved in, in one fell swoop. And the same thing is true in, in, in Afghanistan with the Taliban. So I appreciate very much you, you pointing that out and also that you pointed out, as I said before, uh, that uh, he has been very cooperative and they have captured a number of the terrorists and, uh, uh, and the training camps and the leaders over there. So I, I appreciate your, your being here today. Uh, I just like to say to my colleagues that there's no perfection in war. Uh, in every single war that I've read about, and I've been around quite a while, in every single war, there has been tremendous disenchantment when things weren't going well. Uh, this is no exception. In World War II, and I've talked about this before, because everybody was worried about uh, appeasing Hitler and Mussolini and Tojo and all the others over there, uh, we ended up seeing 62 million people die and about half a million American troops. This, this, this is a very insidious war that we're fighting right now. Uh, Iran is trying to develop a nuclear capability. On my website, I've talked to, uh, to uh, uh, a number of times and showed a mock-up of a briefcase nuclear weapon that weighs about 40 pounds that if we're placed uh, within three blocks of here would kill every one of us. It would destroy eight square blocks and the radioactive fallout would probably kill another 50 to 100,000 people. And so, you know, this is a very difficult time. Uh, and I think Senator Lieberman hits the nail on the head. He sees what's gonna happen. If we uh, start pulling in our horns and not supporting our allies, there will be a vacuum created, in my opinion, in Pakistan, in Iraq, and that's gonna be filled by the radicals. 
and uh, they will not be in any way convinced that they should stop their wild uh, movement toward nuclear development, and it will impair us, imperil not just the Middle East, but the United States as well. So I think we should not be myopic. I think we should look at the big picture and realize, as uh, Winston Churchill did in World War II, that uh, they had to uh, uh, prepare for and, and deal with people like Hitler, and we have to deal with uh, people like the president of, uh, of, of uh, Iran and the leaders in the Taliban and those tribal leaders over there. Otherwise, uh, uh, we're going to have a big problem down the road. So uh, I appreciate very much, again, you being here, and uh, I appreciate your forthrightness, and uh, uh, I hope you'll come back with further reports in the future. Thank you very Thank much. You, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Lynch, you recognize for 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the ranking member as well. I think it's great you're having this hearing, and uh, I appreciate all the attention that you've uh, given to this issue. And I want to thank the Secretary for coming before the committee be and, and helping us with our work. Uh, first of all, I, I just want to say uh, I, I concede the complexity of the task here. Uh, I, I admit, uh, having spent a little time uh, down on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border with Mr. Platt and also the chairman and others who have gone down there as well. Uh, it, it, is, it is a very complex uh, situation. Uh, President Musharraf uh, has a difficult balancing act between the Islamic radicals within his own country. However, I, I must admit, I, I, I must say that I think your assessment of him, even though he may be the irreplaceable man uh, at this point, uh, I still think that, that your assessment of his performance, objectively, is a bit rosier than I, I would, uh, I would get, I would, you know, measure from my, my own uh, judgment of him. I just want to say that uh, having been on the border there, uh, he actually has a policy in place where uh, I was with uh, Colonel Schweitzer with the 82nd Airborne and the uh, 4th Combat Team down there uh, in the Parrot's Beak area, just south of Tora Bora, where he's got some folks where the Taliban are coming across the, uh, the border on a regular basis. And uh, because of Musharraf, uh, we have a no-fire order on our troops. We can't fire into Pakistan in pursuit of uh, Taliban and other forces coming out of that tribal area. And, uh, you know, I, I, w I would say that that area, I, I know terrorists are coming from all over into Pakistan, but, uh, I'm sorry, into Afghanistan, but, but that area there. Uh, Bin Laden has a long-standing history in that area, even when the so they were fighting the Soviets in the uh, war in Afghanistan. He has a long history in that area. Uh, he has had a long-standing friendship with Haqqani and some others who operate in that, in that border area. And that, that is a... That is a definite and central source of, of uh, insurgency, uh, Taliban, Al Qaeda, and others, into Afghanistan, and it's it's uh, it's demanding great resources not only of ourselves but the the Afghani government as well. Uh, I, I also want to point out that uh, the the somewhat uh, offhand comments that the Pakistanis don't have a lot of influence in those tribal areas is a choice that they've made. It's a choice that they've made. They, they made an agreement to create a safe haven there for, for whoever uh, can dominate that area, whether it be the Taliban or Al Qaeda or other, uh, other areas, other, other governments. I know the, the Saudis for a very long time were pumping money into those madrasas. And, uh, you know, we've got 50 percent of the kids in, in Pakistan don't go to school between the ages of five and nine. The fact that these madrasas are, are allowed to operate and are, are being funded uh, provides the only option for a lot of those kids and a lot of those families. You know, I noticed in our own budget we, we, we spend about $10 billion a year in, in Pakistan. A little bit more than one half of one percent of that goes to to USAID for, for uh, helping with education. And uh, I, I really think if we're going to get the root of this, we've got to provide, we can't provide it directly because I don't think we have the credibility in, in Pakistan, especially in those tribal areas, but we've got to have some type of honest broker in there to provide a, a good, solid public education to those kids. Otherwise, 
they will be the terrorists of the future, and we've got to figure out a way of stopping uh, this cycle uh, where the madra madrasas are, are creating uh, jihadists in, in that area. And if we don't get to that, uh, everything else we do will be, will be secondary. Uh, <coughs> You know, and, I, and I'd like to at some point hear, hear your own opinions on uh, what we can do about uh, getting the shackles taken from our own troops on the, in that tribal area to allow them to go after the Taliban and go after Al Qaeda and, and to provide a little bit more cooperation on that border area. Uh, this, this idea that our troops, and I spoke to them personally, they cannot fire over the border even though they know that the Taliban and Al Qaeda and, and uh, those jihadists are, are just over the border and they've been given a safe haven area to launch attacks into Afghanistan. You know, the great criticism of us uh, after 9 11 was that we allowed training camps to operate in, in Afghanistan. We allowed the camps in Tora Bora. We allowed that to happen. We knew they were there and we didn't take action. And 9 11 happened. Well, I have to admit there's a little parallel here. We recognize there's a safe haven here in, in uh, Waziristan. Uh, we know they're operating. We've got some surveillance there. Uh, but we're not, we're not taking direct and deliberate action. And again, I go back to the complexity of the situation that Mr. Musharraf has, and no doubt about it. But I think, uh, I, I think we can push him a little harder. We can demand that, uh, that more positive and affirmative action be taken, you know, against the, the terrorists who are are just growing their organization in that area. I just really believe that, uh, that we're missing an opportunity here. And uh, I'd like to hear, you know, your own views about how we might reduce that threat in Waziristan and, and uh, allow some of the moderate, and there's a lot of moderate influence in Pakistan, allow some of that moderate influence to, to, to predominate and to, to uh, shape the future of that country in a way differently than, than it is right now. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I don't disagree with very much of what you just said. Um, I, I think we all have to be aware of the fact that the Taliban and al-Qaeda operate from these areas, operate in these areas. They're a threat to our troops in Afghanistan. They're a threat to the nation of Afghanistan and what we're trying to achieve there. They're a threat to the nation of Pakistan and to all of us, even in our homeland. And it is one of the critical threats that we have to deal with today. Uh, the question is how we're going to deal with it. And in the end, what we're trying to do is to help the Pakistani government exert better control on its side of the border and the Afghan government exert better control on its side of the border. We do it in different ways. We operate more directly in Afghanistan because that's the relationship we have there and that's because the Afghan government is not fully capable yet. Pakistani government has the forces and has the intention. And I don't, I, I guess, you know, maybe the only difference between what you, some of you are saying and what I'm saying is that um, it's, we're all aware of the things that haven't been done and the problems that exist. Uh, I'm also trying to put out some of the things that have been done and that have been achieved, because I think we have achieved a lot. And if you look at what's happened to the Taliban in Afghanistan, for example, uh, last year, they set out to take towns and cities and territory, and they failed. Uh, this year, they set out again to take towns and cities, particularly looking at Kandahar, and they failed. They talked about a spring offensive, which never materialized. So now they talk about a summer offensive. And indeed, they've been able to mount some actions, but more often than not, all they've been able to do is blow up school children, like they did uh, just the other day in a particularly horrible attack where they killed 12 school, school kids. Um, the Taliban has not succeeded. It's a constant effort to, to get after them, go to, to push them out of places in Afghanistan. Uh, but we've achieved a certain amount of success uh, in the past year against the Taliban, and that's been both through our efforts and the Afghan government efforts, but also because of the pressure that's been brought on them from the Pakistani side. Um, we need to continue our efforts and our allies' efforts and the Afghan efforts and the efforts on the Pakistani side uh, to be completely effective. Okay. Uh, thank you. Now, I want to thank you for your service to our country as well, Mr. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Yarmouth, you'll recognize for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also appreciate your being here and appreciate this hearing. 
One of the things that occurs to me is, as I've read through a lot of material and read through uh, much of the, and consumed much of the media in, in recent weeks, is the question of expectations. And it seems to me that Pakistan offers a, um, an example of that, and I'm wondering whether we have expectations that are not realistic in the sense of looking at governments to do what um, we think needs to be done in combating terrorism. And uh, uh, the thought occurs to me, we talk about polling, we talk about elections, and yet terrorism is by definition anti-democratic. Uh, if you have 99.9 percent .9 of the people agreeing with a certain way of operating and you have 0.1 percent that's intent on undermining that, uh, that the democracy in a certain sense doesn't make any difference. So uh, I'd like you to comment on that with particular respect to uh, Pakistan, but also recognizing we had elections in Iraq and obviously we haven't, uh, it's obvious to me anyway, that that has not particularly helped uh, combat terrorism. And so the entire sense of whether our expectations of governments in combating terrorism, again, in the context of Pakistan particularly, are misplaced. I think, um, I think it's a legitimate question. I, I think we need to understand the background of these situations without trying to make apologies for the way things are. The, the governing relationships in the tribal areas go back to British days. You know, there are, we read British books from 1903 about how they were trying to get a hold of the tribes of Waziristan. You see many of the same problems. The government of Pakistan, when it came into being 60 years ago, um, was unable or didn't change those arrangements. Those arrangements were carried down. And then you had the anti-Soviet period in the 80s um, where we and the Saudis and others funneled a lot of money into those areas and changed some of the relationships. The relationship was always the government dealt with the tribal leaders, the tribal leaders enforced order and discipline. But during the anti-Soviet period, there were other people who rose up, the mullahs and the madrasas that were being heavily financed, um, the partners uh, in the mujahideen against, uh, against the Soviets. There are a whole lot of other forces that came up in society. So even now, the same arrangements exist where the government goes to the tribal leaders and tribal leaders imposed order, but the tribal leaders are no longer the sole repositories of power. Um, and so it's become even more complex up there. So you have to deal with that situation. You have to deal with it in some areas where the government can act directly, like around Quetta in Baluchistan. Uh, some areas where they've tried to work with the tribal areas and it hasn't worked, like in Waziristan. Uh, but overall, you have to do everything you can to help them and expect them to exert government control, understanding that it's a difficult thing to do and that they're going to need different kinds of help. One of the things we've been um, trying to help with now is the Frontier Corps, where people recruited uh, into an army for the local area, from the area, people who know the area, uh, because people from outside the area, not just foreigners, um, you know, Americans or others, but people from other parts of Pakistan, you know, can go in there and get shot at. And that's happened many, many times to uh, regular Pakistanis from other parts of the country. So they want to transform the Frontier Corps into a more effective force for stability and a fighting force there. I was down on the border in Baluchistan um, last month with uh, a colonel who's got, I think it's 160 kilometers to protect. Um, he's got border posts. He's got some body armor for his troops, but he has to divvy it up and to, to the places where it's really important. Other troops have to go without. He's got some night vision goggles. For some places, other troops have to go without. So if we want them to be more effective in controlling the area and controlling the border, we have to be in there with them. And we're trying to, uh, 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 we're asking for money in our budgets, um, including the OA budget, uh, to support the transformation of the, of the Frontier Corps to be a force that can exert better control in that area. Let me, let me ask a, a slightly different question. If it seems to me that it is possible, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm insinuating, but I'm asking you if, if this is possible, that we might have a situation in which you talk about successes, and yes, there have been some, and some leaders have been um, captured and killed, that there is a, a calculation that uh, I can, um, if I were Musharraf, I could uh, bring in a couple of these token 
um, leaders in order to uh, portray myself adequately as a, an effective fighter in order to gener con generate continued support, uh, while at the same time I can play both sides and allow some of these things to happen. Are, are you confident that that's not happening in, in Pakistan, or is that a possibility? I, uh, I suppose theoretically it could be there, but I don't really see it happening. Um, I see a difficult situation they've dealt with in different ways. Um, we do, you know, we, we have seen sometimes signs every now and then that the uh, uh, there's not a wholehearted effort at all levels in all institutions in Pakistan, and we've raised those uh, when we need to. Uh, but we've seen a great deal of cooperation against some very serious and difficult uh, targets. They've picked up uh, 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 really high-level people from the Taliban, they've helped us get the highest level people from the Taliban. Um, and we've seen, I think, more and more cooperation as the months go on. And I think particularly since about December last year, uh, we've seen a lot more cooperation and, and uh, a lot more effective cooperation. I'm, uh, again, looking kind of at, um, universally at this problem, one of the things that, that I think frustrates all of us is that we look across the spectrum of um, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, a myriad places, we see a variety of settings and situations, and yet uh, there really doesn't seem to be any example of where the war on terror has succeeded. Uh, are we looking, again, going to the question of expectations, are we looking at something in which there will never be success, uh, or are we uh, just we haven't found the right approach to success. I think uh, you get back to your question about expectations. Um, it's, it, it takes a long time. I think, you know, I certainly think we're all going to be taking our shoes off at airports for decades to come. Um, that we're going to have to integrate a certain level of higher security in all our lives and all our actions throughout the world and all our embassies and what my colleagues will do in the future. Um, at the same time, this process of sort of getting government control, getting legitimate government control over all parts of the planet, you know, it, it has moved forward. It's certainly not done yet and certainly not done in, in very important parts of my area. Um, but um, I can see it proceeding. I can see the Afghan government building up, building out, expanding throughout its territory. I can see the pressure on the extremists in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. And, um, you know, as we looked, you say, where has it succeeded? Um, there, there are countries you could cite, I guess, Yemen, Sudan, other places like that that have turned around and, and been forces against terrorism. In, in the area that I deal with, I think what we did last summer was to look at what works in Afghanistan. And what works in Afghanistan is a very, comp very uh, comprehensive strategy, well-integrated strategy, where you take, you, you move the troops in to kick out the Taliban and fight the bad guys. Then you bring in district officers, government officers, uh, agents from ministries, uh, policemen, local forces to help provide safety and security and justice to the people there. And you bring in the aid projects, the irrigation, the new crops, the roads, the electricity. If you do that in a comprehensive and integrated manner, we've been able to stabilize large parts of Afghanistan that way. And um, as we see some of these problems, they're more and more in certain areas of Afghanistan uh, rather than throughout the country. Uh, the same with the narcotics problem. Uh, one of the things you'll see, despite the enormous crop that's going to be harvested this year, there are going to be more parts of the country that are largely poppy free. And the problem of poppy is more and more associated with the areas of insurgency. Again, the basic question of having government control and giving people the benefits of government throughout the country. So I think we've seen what works in parts of Afghanistan, and the reason we came into Congress this year with a supplemental request and the funding request of $11.6 billion over two years for Afghanistan is because we looked at what worked and we said we've got to do this more generally throughout the country. 
Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To yield back. Mr. Ambassador, I, I want to, as you know, the votes have been called, uh, but there's three quick votes. Uh, we're going to run right up to the nip of time on the 15-minute vote and go down quickly. There'll be a five and a five. We'll be back within 15 minutes, if that's good with you. But Mr. Shays okay. is going to take his 10 minutes now that will run us up to that time. Good. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shays. You recognize the 10 minutes. Mr. Bauscher, I appreciate you being here. I think this is a hugely important issue. I have tremendous concerns about uh, Pakistan. Uh, I think uh, you have a uh, a, basically a dictator who took control from a secular government uh, and now to maintain control he's responding in my judgment to sectarian wishes. So the irony is I think he's more vulnerable to the sectarian pressures uh, than a duly elected secular government would be. That's one bias I have. Another bias I have that I want you to respond to is uh, I find it outrageous that of the 46,000 troops, we're 26,000. I've learned that of the 20,000 NATO troops, only four countries are at the tip of the spear. So most of our troops are in, in direct line of fire, whereas some of the NATO troops. I'd like you to tell me why only four NATO troops are putting their soldiers at risk, um, because uh, I find that uh, just astonishing. Uh, with what we have to do in Iraq and Afghanistan, it seems to me our allies, if they don't agree with what we're doing in Iraq, should at least agree in Afghanistan. So I'd like you to comment on, on that as well. And then I have some other questions. Um, on, the, uh, on the question of sort of the, the centrist, the stability of uh, Pakistan and, and the military rule of military government there, um, I think on the one hand, um, we all think Pakistan would be better off, more stable with an elected government, and that's why we're pushing so hard for uh, fair and free elections this year, why we're supporting that with our rhetoric, but also our money and our, and our effort, why we're working with all the political parties to try to achieve that. Um, we believe that democracy is a force for stability. We believe that an elected government, particularly one that brings together the centrist parties, uh, would be a better base on which to fight extremism in the country. And frankly, I've heard that from political leaders, from opposition parties. I've heard that from President Musharraf himself. I think everybody recognizes that that uh, is the case. So we all look to elections to be a force for stability. Um, we've seen a lot of change in Pakistan in the last eight years. It's not purely a military dictatorship. We've seen a lot of politics, we've seen the growth of civil society, we've seen an explosion of, of media and free press. Um, uh, we've tried to support that and speak out in favor of it whenever it was under threat. Um, but in, in the end, it's created a direction for the society, a more modern, moderate, open direction for the society, and one that's done well by most of its citizens. So. I think um, <coughs> as you look at the problems of extremism, that just sort of the general process of building the stronger, moderate center is one that's very important to all of us, and we've tried to support that. How about NATO? Um, NATO has, um, uh, first of all, a lot of different countries involved in a lot of different ways. And I do think we have to say that every contribution is appreciated and every contribution is, uh, is important. Um, whether you're trying to uh, uh, run a PRT in the north somewhere where uh, you may be dealing with local authorities and trying to extend the, the governor and the government, uh, or whether you're in the south fighting the Taliban and the drug traffickers. Wh um, why is it that we only have four countries willing to engage in battle? It's, it's probably more than four, but not too many more than four. I'd have to do the count. Why? I mean, the, the Canadians, the Dutch, um, the British, us, um, there are a few others, Romanians and a few others who are What down about there. the French, the Italians? I mean, do, do they They're there. Some of them are in different places doing different missions. We have argued very strongly every NATO meeting we go to, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, for countries to drop what are called their caveats. You know, we'll do this, but won't do that. We'll go here, but not there. And we've had a little bit of success over the course, say, the last six months, getting some of those caveats dropped by some of the countries. Uh, we've had some success in getting more NATO troops there. There have been about 7,000 troops promised uh, since uh, last fall, but again, half of those are American, 
big chunk of Brits, British, Australians, uh, a few others like that, Canadians. So uh, the mission rests on the willingness of the countries argument? to participate. What, what is their argument? If they can make an argument against Iraq. What is their argument against participating by risking their lives in Afghanistan like our troops are? What is their argument for not doing that? Um, they're, they're, uh, Depends on the country. Sometimes you get, well, you know, we're doing this in Africa, we're doing this in Bosnia, we're doing this in Kosovo. We don't have any more, you know, available. Uh, sometimes it's um, we don't have popular support and parliamentary support uh, for a war fighting mission. We only have that support from our parliament to go on a peacekeeping or a humanitarian mission. Um, variety of things that you hear. The bottom line. Um for me is we have long-term and short-term needs. Our short-term needs are shutting down training camps, stopping threats to U.S. coalition troops in Afghanistan, um, and, and uh, that's emanating from Pakistan. A long-term would be education reform, democracy building, uh, democracy building, women's rights, and so on. Um, tell me how successful we've been on the short-term. I think, um, first of all, I I think you're right in the way you put it, and that we were involved in some transformations that will take years, but we're also looking for goals and results that need to be done now because people are under direct threat. Um, I, I guess I'd come back and say we've had some successes in the short term. Uh, part of the fact that we've been able to blunt the Taliban intentions and that the Taliban has failed uh, this year in Afghanistan is because what we're doing in Afghanistan, but also because there's pressure on them and on the Pakistan side. Uh, we've seen a great number of very dangerous people uh, picked up and killed uh, or arrested uh, with the help of Pakistan. So um, we're making progress. We're not done with the problem. My colleague had a question that he wanted to ask. Sure. Uh, thank you for yielding. Uh, the tribal leaders, I don't know that this question has been asked, have the tribal leaders or any of the tribal leaders uh, been cooperative in trying to stop uh, the Taliban leaders? Uh, sure. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, to my knowledge, that hasn't been really illuminated here. I mean, well, you saw Mashar, that. Mashar has pulled his troops out of a, a number of areas, and, and the impression is that uh, the Taliban's taken, and the Al Qaeda's taken over those areas because of the cooperation of the tribal leaders. And so, what I'd like to know is, do we have cooperation with uh, uh, a lot of the tribal leaders, and uh, are they working with us to try to, and Musharraf to, to I think, try to? Um, I think we've seen cooperation between the Pakistan government and the tribal leaders. We saw the tribal leaders in some areas turn on the Uzbeks, for example, earlier this year, uh, turn on some of the Taliban that were coming out of that area. Um, I, I think it is true that as the checkpoints and the government presence in Waziristan was removed last fall, that there was an influx of fighters, that Al Qaeda would found more freedom to operate there. And then since about December, there have been some steps by the government and the tribes to exert more control. There have been new forces that have been moved in there. There have been che checkpoints reestablished. Be before my time taking uh, back ends, control. Uh, what right would the United States, if we saw Osama bin Laden in Pakistan, uh, what would likely our posture be? Would we wait to get permission and then fear that we would lose him, or would we just go in and get him if I, he were in Pakistan? I think um, we would work with the Pakistanis to make sure that one way or the other he was gotten. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, thank you for your forbearance and your patience, Mr. Uh, Ambassador. We're going to be gone for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes if you'd like to take a little uh, recess. Uh, and we'll be back for the uh, concluding questions. Glad to. Thank you. Please.
Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your patience on that. We're going to reconvene, and because we're such a great uh, committee here, Mr. Shays is speaking on the floor on another matter. Uh, he's perfectly comfortable with us proceeding in his absence. He, he will be back uh, on that. Mr. Hodes, who was next to speak uh, on this, is not certain that he's going to be able to uh, come back as he had a conflict. Mr. Van Holland, I understand, is on his way back. So while that's all happening, I thought I'd uh, take the prerogative of the chair uh, and uh, ask a few questions that we're probably going to have to put off until the end, uh, but may not have to do that now. Uh, I'm sort of struck, I have to tell you, that uh, with what I see as somewhat of a defense of the, of the Musharraf uh, you know, actions here in, in, uh, in all ways, and it seems to be the administration's position, so I don't leave it just with you, but it, it doesn't really seem to me to be what's happening on the ground from our own observations or from the myriad of people that we talk to. I know you've spoken to a range of people, uh, and, and so do we, in a, an opportunity not just while we were in country, but also back here uh, and uh, as witnesses and testimony. And it seems like there's, you know, the, Mr. Musharraf's, you know, view of things and perspective and then everybody else's uh, on that and that the administration is sort of coming down with a Musharraf view. Um, I'm struck by your repetition that you think we're getting cooperation on the uh, border area because a couple people have been arrested and, uh, you know, uh, there, you say there's, there's a number of troops on the border. My observation is where they're not quite on the border, uh, that they're up toward the border and that you have a few frontier core groups up on the border and, and they're not very active in that. The issue I'm seeing here is we have a government that appears, and Mr. Shea's had a hit on that, uh, to lack in legitimacy. Uh, because you have a, a person that took office through a coup, has been operating both as a military general and uh, as a president. Uh, we have questionable uh, progress towards elections here, some real serious concerns about whether they're going to be free and fair. Uh, and then we have today reported uh, in a, uh, a number of ways about a national intelligence estimate, uh, which apparently is classified, but uh, uh, par for the course, uh, uh, executive branch people seem to be chatting about it. Then they want to blame it on Congress for a, uh, for a leak, I'm sure. Uh, even to the point where uh, people who are not talking directly about the report but about it are testifying in front of congressional committees. And what they're telling us is that, you know, despite what you say and Mr. Musharraf says about uh, all this activity, that area uh, leaves Al Qaeda better positioned to strike the West, according to uh, one of the uh, counter National Counterterrorism Center uh, commentators, uh, John Kringen who is the Deputy Director for Intelligence of the CIA, says Al-Qaeda appears to be fairly well settled into the safe haven and the ungoverned spaces of Pakistan. We see more training, we see more money, we see more communications. Um, I mean, it just goes on and on. The new report concludes the group is stronger than it has been in years. There is a heightened concern over Al-Qaeda's operational activity and operational levels among the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, one U.S. official said. Uh, at the end, uh, we see a worse condition than it was before the agreements up in Waziristan, uh, and, and it goes on on that basis. So clearly, to some of us, uh, apparently not to General Musharraf or, or to you, th there's not the kind of activity that we would hope we would be getting out of somebody that's supposed to be a partner. And a lot of it may well be because of the fear of the instability of his government. We look at reports in the paper on July 8th about a United States aborted raid on al-Qaeda al chiefs in Pakistan in 2005. And reportedly the reason that we didn't go in, even though there was identification of targets we wanted to get, was a fear of the instability of the uh, Musharraf regime and the fact that we went in they were afraid of what ramifications it might have. Wouldn't we be better off insisting that there be free and fair elections, that all participants be allowed to be in the country and take part in them, so that there was a legitimacy behind any Pakistani government so that when they, we needed to go after uh, al-Qaeda types or Taliban in that area, we wouldn't have to fear the instability of a government would have a properly elected, you know, a duly appointed government with the legitimacy that could stand with us and do something there as opposed to what we have now. Turn my mic on, sorry. <laughs> um, sir, I, I've been tried, I, I've tried to be objective with it with my statements here and try to look at the whole picture. Uh, I've said the, the agreements in Waziristan didn't work. There was an influx of al-Qaeda. They found more freedom of movement uh, when the checkpoints were removed. And they've been able to reorganize themselves to some extent in that area. And that's a current threat and that's an important threat to all of us, to Pakistan, Afghanistan and, and to our homeland. And we need to deal with it. We need to deal with it working with the Pakistanis. But at the same time, I think we need to recognize what they have done. 
and we need to recognize the direction they're headed in and we need to look at how to help them to be more effective and, and completely effective well i guess you know, we, we don't have to disagree to about looking at what they have done i mean but, I, I recognize the yeah. pakistanis have died there and, and we would be uh, wrong to, to not understand that they've suffered pain on that and people have given their lives and, and made the effort yeah. and would be wrong to not recognize that some people have been uh, killed or arrested uh, with their cooperation but the fact of the matter is you say looking forward what they are doing when we look forward from our perspective you know and, and see that they're not doing all that you seem to indicate you believe they're doing you know and the own NIE and the reports of the NIE seem to indicate that as well that, that area is not getting the attention and the action that's needed. You referred a couple of times to the Uzbeks out there. And I can tell you, when we were there during that operation, and we got a variance of estimates between 100 Uzbeks to 3,000 Uzbeks. And depending on which intelligence agency you talked to, which military group, or what government you were talking to, it ranged back and forth. But almost all of them right, recognized the fact that it essentially was one Taliban group fighting another Taliban group, with the government putting its foot on the scale at the tail end and then claiming that it had been instrumental in helping uh, remove the Uzbeks. Uh, if that's what you're referring to as, you know, their great efforts and looking forward how much they're being cooperative with us, I think we have a problem. You know, the, the, the fact really is that we're giving enormous amounts of military money, but I don't see any accountability of that being spent on equipment that will help in an anti-terrorism, international terrorism effort, more so than stocking up on what might be a fear they have about India. We have enormous monies in basic uh, support. Uh, that I don't think we have any accountability at all uh, in terms of how much of that really goes for reimbursement of what they might have spent on military efforts, particularly when those military efforts don't, be, don't show any fruits being born here. And I think in a, in a nutshell, that's really where we're going at here and wondering why this administration continues. You say you've been objective, and I appreciate that, but I guess some of us are concerned you may be too objective. You may not be standing here taking a subjective enough look and weighing in at what's not been done here. Uh, and what could be done if we had you know, a, a government with more legitimacy and a willingness to stand up there and take a tough stand, both on the border area and as they at least started to do uh, with some of the internal extremists that are going on uh, with Red Mosque the other day? I think, um, let me try to answer quickly because these are, but these are serious questions. I mean, um, there's no doubt in our mind that there are real dangers that emanate from this area. Um, there's no doubt in our mind that we need to deal with them. Um, that we need to work with the Pakistanis to deal with them more effectively. And that's what we're focused on. That's focused on getting after the rest of the Taliban, the Taliban and, and the Pakistan side, their supporters, the Haqqani network, people like that, uh, focused on how to identify and get the Al Qaeda elements that are there, how to get the training camps, the leadership bases, and things like that. And that's something that's a constant daily very close, very dedicated effort that we carry on. Um, would all this be aided by a, um, a, an open election, a democratic and credible election, and a better, a strengthened moderate center uh, with more legitimacy in Pakistan? Uh, absolutely. And that's why we've seen uh, an election as a force for stability and a successful transition from military rule to civilian elected government this year. Uh, as being one of the key elements in helping Pakistan come together in a moderate center in order to fight extremism better. You know, ought we not condition some of our uh, financial assistance on the performance of free and fair elections? Ought we make it really clear to this uh, Musharraf administration that unless they start working uh, more cooperatively, we have the election commission work more cooperatively in getting the registration in order, unless they do all the other things that are necessary to have a truly free and fair election, uh, shouldn't we condition some of our resources that go to him, particularly the basic support, uh, which I think there's some argument makes some of that's a slush fund. Anyway, he's conditioned some of that uh, on performance. Doesn't I, that make sense? Well, I mean, some of our some of our money that we give to Pakistan is reimbursements, and so there is you know conditions that they, we pay for things. If if they didn't have the 85,000 troops in the border area, God knows what would be going on out there. Um, not anything we could deal with ourselves, I'm sure. Uh, so we, we do get something, the fact that they're there. Um, they can do more. Uh, they can, we can all do more. We're doing more on the Afghan side. We've asked for enormous influx of funds from the Congress, which Congress has supported, so we can do more on the Afghan side. With both sides of the border, there's a lot more to do. Um, in terms of sort of conditioning our other assistance, um, 
I, you've talked about the importance of education, of getting a better public education system in Pakistan. You've talked about uh, the support for, for democracy, for civil society, justice, things like that. And we need to do all those things. I don't, I, it's not a question of conditioning and saying unless you do this, unless you do that. It's a question of saying all these things are important to us. Where there is no doubt in anybody's mind, the United States wants to see a free, fair, and open election in Pakistan this year. Uh, there's no doubt in anybody's mind um, that we're working very hard to achieve that, both in our work directly with political parties, but also our work with the Election Commission and, and uh, everything we do in Pakistan. I, I think, Mr. Bassett, there's a real question about the, uh, the urgency behind our wanting these elections to be free and fair and the urgency of, of making sure that it happens. Um, and, and I think that that would be resolved by conditioning it because I think that some people might not take it as serious unless we do something more serious on that. I'm going to interrupt my question because Mr. Van Hollen has, uh, has joined us and he's entitled to 10 minutes of questioning. Recognize for 10 minutes, Mr. Van Hollen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding the series of hearings uh, on the situation in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and other parts of South Asia. Mr. Ambassador, uh, let me just join others in welcoming you and thanking you for your service to our country. Uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, I, as I understood your earlier testimony, uh, you had a number of questions related to an article that appeared today on the front page of the Washington Post, uh, essentially entitled, U.S. Warns of Stronger Al-Qaeda. And as I understood your response, you said you were not familiar with that report. Is that correct? I, I've seen the Washington Sto Post story, but the uh, Washington Post seemed to have gotten the intelligence report before it came into my reading. Right. Here, here's my question. One of the things we as a country decided uh, after 9-11, it was one of the key recommendations of the 9-11 Commission, was that we would try and get away from the stovepipe approach to collecting anal and analyzing information so that all people who were experts and had information to contribute with respect to this kind of analysis would participate. So I, I have to say I'm surprised that you woke up this morning and read about this in the Washington Post along with the rest of us when, and this is obviously no fault of your own if you weren't in the loop, but I, it's surprising to me given the fact that we did say uh, we wanted more people to be involved in this process. I, I recognize it's an intelligence analysis. On the other hand, you are essentially the, the, the senior policy person when it comes to South Asia. You obviously have a lot to say with respect to interpreting analysis and now analyzing information regarding the political military situation in Pakistan. And I, I got to say, I'm surprised to hear you didn't know about the report. Can you it, enlighten us a little bit to how this process uh, works, should work? Uh, well, if, if I'm supposed to, if I believe what I read in the Washington Post, the report isn't even finished yet. Um, and generally, NIEs, they finish it up before they send it around. You know, that said, um, I, I do, I am part of the information and analysis process every day. And I'm constantly reading the raw material and the reports that are coming in from embassy sources and intelligence sources, just all over, all kinds of different sources. And I have a constant dialogue with the folks in the intelligence community. We meet on a very regular basis. Uh, I see somebody every morning uh, that I talk to. So I, I know this is kind of the sum a summary that's being done at this moment that I may not have seen that particular document yet. but. The underlying trends are something I think I'm very familiar with because of these constant discussions. And we've talked about how um, the Al Qaeda has presence in Pakistan has, has uh, grown and how it's been reorganized and how what the dangers are from that. Okay. Well, then, do you share the uh, assessment that was given by one of your colleagues who's in the intelligence community before the Armed Services Committee yesterday, the House Armed Services Committee? Uh, John Kringen, who said Al Qaeda seems to be fairly well settled into the safe haven and ungoverned spaces of Pakistan. Do you agree with that conclusion? I, I basically agree with the conclusion, but not, it's not the whole story. All right. I guess my question is have, what has our position been, you as the head policy uh, maker for this region, in terms of communicating the Pakistani government whether we support? their decision to essentially have these hands-off, described by your colleagues as safe haven uh, areas where, as I understand it, our, according to public reports, our intelligence community has included that has allowed al-Qaeda to uh, strengthen itself, as he says, 
we see more training, more money, more communications. Uh, what have we said to the government of Pakistan with respect to our position on whether that was a good idea or not a good idea? Sir, I think we've made absolutely clear that uh, the presence of Al Qaeda in Pakistan is a danger to all of us in whatever strength they are at any given moment, and that we look to them for cooperation as we have since 9 11, um, for cooperation against the Al Qaeda elements and the Taliban elements who have been able to take refuge and operate from Pakistan. Right. But do, uh, do you agree a, with your that's colleague? It's a constant that, effort. Do you agree with your colleague that providing the safe haven has allowed Al Qaeda to strengthen itself? I, 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 I do, but providing safe haven, I mean, let's, let's not draw improper implications from that. Um, this is not done with, account, with, with the uh, authorization of the Pakistani government. They did some things um, that led to that influx and strengthening. But the Pakistani government has made very clear through its words and its actions that it, too, is opposed to extremism. It, too, is opposed to the president of al-Qaeda. In just the last few weeks, you've seen President Musharraf at the Jirga in Peshawar making that explicitly clear. In the, over the course of time, you've seen hundreds of arrests of al-Qaeda people in Pakistan, and you've seen pressure uh, on various al-Qaeda associates and people that are in these tribal areas. We know there's still a lot of them there. There's a lot of training. There's command and control that are still there that need to be gotten at. Um, but it's not, they're not there, you know, with a, with a, as a policy of the Pakistani government. I understand. But I, as you said, words and actions, and one of the actions the Pakistani government took was obviously to enter into this arrangement with the leaders in that region, and at least our publicly reported intelligence assessment is that has resulted in a strengthening of al-Qaeda. Let me, let me just go on and pick up on a point that uh, the chairman and others have made with respect to uh, making sure we have open and democratic elections. Uh, this committee uh, back in May uh, took testimony from a Dr. Samina Ahmed, who is the South Asia Project Director for the International Crisis yep. uh, Group. You probably, I'm sure you know her, and yep. she provided testimony to this committee via satellite. And essentially what her message was, uh, was that Musharraf had actually relied to a certain extent uh, in terms of putting together a coalition on some of the uh, more religious uh, parties in Pakistan to provide the majority he needed essentially to stay in power in contrast to some of the more moderate uh, parties. In fact, I'm just reading from her testimony. She said, lacking a civilian constituency, Musharraf remains dependent today on the religious parties, particularly his coalition partner in the Baluchistan government, uh, the JUI, the pro-Taliban party, and the major partner in the MMA alliance to counter his moderate civilian opposition. That's her testimony. My first question is, do you share that assessment? That's one of the results of the election in 2002 and, and some of the subsequent arrangements, and that's one of the important things about a new election. It gives an opportunity for the moderate center to reform. Right. But, I mean, do you, do you share that essential analysis of his political reliance on some of the religious parties to maintain his governing coalition? In, in some of the provincial assemblies, particularly Baluchistan, he does rely on the religious parties. In uh, the National Assembly, they're in they're, all of them are in opposition to Musharraf, and you've seen that in recent days, the way they've spoken about the mosque, frankly. Right. Now, in terms of the position we've taken with respect to the upcoming elections, and I appreciate your statement that we're pushing for free and fair elections. Uh, in specific terms, have we publicly called on President Musharraf, for example, to make sure that Benazir Bhutto is allowed to return to Pakistan? Um, We've, we've said that all the parties need to be able to participate and the voters need to be given real choices. But when it comes to individuals, I think each of them faces a particular situation with regard to justice and other things in Pakistan. And so yeah, but see, no, this, we, have not, this, we have not gone to endorse specific individuals. Well, well this does get to the, the chairman's question, it seems to me, about the urgency and, and the content, policy content behind the words. Because I think, uh, many people would agree that with respect to the People's Party, you, if you have a, a leader uh, who is the, you know, essentially the uh, selected leader of a particular political party, and you don't allow them to come back and participate in the elections, uh, clearly 
you are not allowing for a free and fair election. Uh, it seems to me, if our position is that we want free and fair elections, uh, we need to be making sure that anybody who wants to run, individuals included, as the head of their party, are allowed to return. Why, why, why shouldn't we do that? And why is it, how is it consistent to say uh, we want free and fair elections but not call upon the president to allow the return of the leader of one of the major opposition parties? Uh, because our job as the United States, I don't think, is to endorse any particular party or any particular candidate. Uh, let me um, just, I want to interrupt. I'm not, I'm not talking about endorsing any candidate. I'm not talking about endorsing any candidate. I'm talking about making real the statement that we want free and fair elections. I'm saying we want to call upon the government to make sure that any individual who wants to participate, I, I, we, of course, we should not go anywhere near endorsing any candidate in any election. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, but it seems to me, wouldn't you agree that if to have a free or fair election, and free or fair election, every individual or, or certainly party leader who wants to participate in that election should be allowed to be present in Pakistan and fully participate? Um, there are three different leaders of political parties in Pakistan who are outside the country, three major leaders right. who are outside the country. They each face different circumstances, different judicial circumstances and other things. They're out for different reasons. They face different things if they go back. Um, Ms. Bhutto always talks about going back, talks about facing justice. Uh, w whether she does that or not depends to some extent on, on what she decides and how it works out with the government. But you know, in individual circumstances, I guess we think have to be addressed by the individual and the government. Uh, if, I, if I could just, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yeah. one question with respect to the situation uh, in Afghanistan in Afghanistan, and I, I wrote a letter to the Secretary of uh, State yeah, with, with respect to the, the situation it, there. I think we all uh, agree on, uh, on this issue, which is we want to make sure that as we aggressively go after Al Qaeda and aggressively go after the Taliban, uh, we do everything possible to limit uh, civilian casualties, non-combatant non casualties. After all, Part of the mission is to make sure we win the hearts and minds of the people in Afghanistan. And a concern that has been raised uh, is that partly as a result of the fact that there are, are, according to some assessments, not enough U.S. and allied forces, ground forces uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, we have relied more on uh, air power, uh, which is less discriminating in terms of the, the targets. Uh, and that overall, and that Karzai himself, the President of Pakistan, has, has said uh, that he thinks that the level of civilian casualties has not been justifiable. If you could just address uh, this issue, because clearly uh, we want to do everything we can to root out Al Qaeda and Taliban, and the Taliban, but it is clearly counterproductive if in the process of trying to do that, we lose the support of the local population, because that makes it more difficult to uh, accomplish our mission. Absolutely, sir. And I, I think uh, we all understand how, how very important this is. Um, it was just at the Rule of Law Conference um, for Afghanistan that was held in Rome last week. And uh, President Karzai, I think, put it well. He said, you know, we're, we're all there to protect the innocents of Afghanistan. And it's the innocent people of Afghanistan that deserve our protection. and, and can't be made casualties of the fighting. Um, we, we know we're fighting an enemy that puts civilians in harm's way, that we've had cases where they've you know, kept people locked up inside compounds where they were operating from. Um, we've had cases you know, where they, well, frequently, where they take refuge in com civilian compounds and areas, uh, knowing that if we go after them, there'll be some civilian casualties, and then they publicize it. Um, so it's a difficult enemy, an enemy that often goes out to kill civilians, I mean, kill school kids, kill school teachers, kill policemen. Uh, and recognizing how difficult it is for our military people, I think we and our military all understand how critical it is to success in the bigger mission, that they do everything they can to minimize civilian casualties. So each one of these incidents is taken very seriously. Each one of these incidents looked at very carefully. Um, we do have strict rules of engagement that we're always trying to improve, and uh, we need to do it better, and we 
I think we're trying very hard to do that. No, I, I, I appreciate yeah. I realize and understand fully the, the tactical challenge uh, yeah. here, given the enemy that is being faced and the fact that yeah. they've been unscrupulous and, as you say, have uh, uh, killed civilians on the other side uh, in, you know, brazen sort of terrorist type activities, yeah. no doubt about it. Uh, but as you say, in order to accomplish the larger mission, we need to make sure we uh, go after them without yeah. in any way enlarging or expanding uh, their political uh, yeah. support. And as Karzai has said, I, uh, he, he, it has been at least his feeling, uh, as he publicly stated, uh, that we can uh, do better. So yeah. I think we just need to make sure that we I, I should address the other half of your question, whether the, you know, with air power versus civilian versus military yeah. forces, um, I'm probably not the best qualified to try to address that. What I do know is that um, there's a, you know, there's still a, a shortfall in the NATO force requirements, and we've worked very hard to try to get people to meet that force shortfall. And then there's the question of flexibility of the forces. And our feeling is that, you know, whatever commanders decide they need, they need to have the tools available. And we push very hard on all countries to give the NATO commanders the flexibility and the capability to do the job in the best way possible with a minimum, absolute minimum, of civilian casualties. And so our feeling is that having that additional flexibility and capability would make give the commanders more tools to use and perhaps uh, make it a little easier for them to avoid these casualties. But I, I want to say that whatever they've got as tools, whatever they can use, they make a very serious effort and continuing effort to improve this uh, in order to avoid civilian casualties. Thank you. I mean, yeah. but do you, do, do you believe that the uh, fact that we haven't hit the full troop levels that we think we need, that we are somewhat short, has resulted in a somewhat over-reliance on air power that would not otherwise be used? I, I've seen it said, but I'm not qualified to judge, I guess. Thank, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, does it at all trouble the State Department and the administration that uh, Jalaluddin Haqqani continues to be free despite uh, the Musharraf administration and their military telling us they know where he is, and despite uh, some pretty prevalent rumors that he may also be providing bin Laden protection as his guests up in the, uh, under the Pashtun culture situation? I mean, uh, why is it that we don't press harder for more definitive action to be taken against Mr. Haqqani? I think he's one of a number of uh, facilitators of the Taliban on the Pakistani side that, that uh, are part of the problem, that, that do need to be uh, uh, taken out of the picture, arrested, eliminated, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, there are a number of areas where we've seen support for the Taliban uh, from people and groups on the Pakistani side. The Quetta Shura around Balochistan was one of the major problems that we had earlier this year, and we've gone after, Pakistanis have helped us go after a number of those people. There's the Haqqani network, there's other the facilitators, network, and yes. I mean, it's as simple as look, turning on the TV and watching Frontline, where they're interviewing uh, members of the uh, Musharraf regime, saying, well, yeah, we, we know uh, where Mr. Haqqani is, and we know who he is, and, you know, um, and when they asked point blank, why don't you just go in and get them? No answer. I mean, how is it that we're not pressing uh, I, for something as simple as that to be done? Everybody understands the role this individual is playing uh, and understands think, the need to do it. I think we all do understand the role that he's playing. He's one of the targets that needs to be got. But the, not the inability to do it because they've tried and failed, but the unwillingness to try to do it, I should think would somehow color what's otherwise been by you a pretty rosy uh, picture of, uh, we think, the cooperation of the Musharraf uh, government. I, I, we've talked about things that have been done and things that remain to be done. This is one of the things that remains to be done. Boy, when I say so. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to leave it on that issue and go on to another, but a uh, uh, quote that one of our witnesses at our most recent hearing had is, the choice that Pakistan faces is not between the military and the mullahs, as is generally believed in the West, including the United States. It's between genuine democracy and a mullah military alliance that is responsible for the religious extremism that poses a threat to Pakistani regional and international security. That was a, a sentiment that I found to be prevalent through all segments of the Pakistani society, Not people testifying here, people that we've met with here in Washington, and the myriad of people from different occupations as well as different political parties that we met there. I would hope that 
this administration at least has some recognition of that that's a fairly prevalent feeling amongst Pakistanis. And if we want to start being friends of the Pakistani people as opposed to one individual who took over a coup in 1999, that we've got to somehow reflect in our policy and our decisions that we understand that's their feeling and, and maybe press harder in some areas. Let me just cover some other areas quickly so I can let you go on this, and I appreciate the time you're spending. What's our strategy with respect to the, the Fatah area, the federally administered tribal areas? You know, who's going to be our development partner up there? To whom are we going to give this substantial amount of money uh, that you've mentioned? Is it going to be to uh, local uh, non-government uh, officials, to tribal leaders, to international NGOs? Uh, it's, a, it's a considerable amount of money, and, and how do we make sure it's accounted for and that it goes to the purposes that, for which we intend? Um, if, if I can comment on the military question. Absolutely, sure. Um, that's certainly a prevalent view, and it's, and it's, I think, been a clear view in the past that, um, you know, the military, that's, if you look at Pakistani history and the history of some of the military regimes, um, uh, you see a, a alliance at various moments with some of the more extremist uh, religious elements. Uh, and that was accentuated particularly during the anti-Soviet fight. I mean, that was the... That was the core, uh, the mullahs, the military, and the mujahideen uh, of fighting the Soviets. And so, you know, all the contributions that we and others made helped solidify that kind of alliance. Um, but I think, you know, times change, things change, and, and the circumstances change over time. And I, I find it hard to say there's a military mullah alliance in Pakistan on the day that the military has just completed an operation against an extremist mosque. Well, I guess um, the, the point there being so it took them several months to get to that point, and the people that make this statement it rather recently took them 20, that, 30 years to get to that point. But well, this particular government, they've of been Mr. Sharp, it, it took several months since the time eight, that this incident months, started yeah. uh, to do it. And again, going back to Mr. Haqqani and example after example of sort of an allowance of things to fester and to build up without action being taken until absolutely forced to take it. And then, yes, you know, some people are going to be upset, but the point is. You know, uh, but for their fear for that and their, what some people perceive as that alliance, things would have been done a lot uh, sooner and would continue at a lot higher level on that. But to, to the let other me, point. Let me answer your question on the, on the tribal area funding. Um, one of the key elements, I think, of the plan that was developed, the tribal area development strategy, was to build the institutions that can do things and handle funding and to build a, uh, a tribal area development organization. Uh, they can reliably use money, build the schools, build the vocational training centers, put in the roads, whatever needs to be done uh, under that plan. They can do it reliably, effectively, get results, provide the information, make sure it was done uh, the right way and not wa money was not wasted. And so uh, a lot of the effort at the beginning of the program is, in fact, to build those institutions and capabilities there. We also run. Hey, can I just interject? Do you, where do you think that stands right now? I mean, do you think you've completed that? I think it's task? Uh, it's just starting. Basically, we're just getting started on a lot of this stuff. We already have uh, some pretty effective counter narcotics programs in the area, uh, where we build roads, um, we provide training, um, do a lot of different things with counter narcotics money in the tribal areas. And some places we're able to do that, some not so well. But we use contractors. Um, to do things there. We're able to check up and make sure it gets done. We're, we have an aid program to build 65 schools in the tribal areas, and we use contractors there who do the work, but we're able to check and make sure it's, uh, it gets done properly. Yeah. Did you, I don't know if you had something else to say. I, I just wanted to make sure we cover that point. Are you, are you completed on that? Yeah. Thank you. The, uh, the money that we, um, that we spend in Pakistan, uh, broken down a little bit into different categories. And I'm, I'm interested in uh, your comments on some of the accountability. The budgetary support aspect, $200 million, how do we account for that? A couple different ways. Um, I mean, account for it. We know where the money goes. Well, originally. The question is. You deliver a check, and you know we, we deliver goes a check. Their the budget. point is, after that, where does it go? How do we know what gets done with it? A right. um, couple things. First, the, the, the first purpose of the money in providing it as budgetary support is so that they can um, take care of budget and fiscal policy in a way that strengthens the economy. It's macroeconomic reform money. So the first purpose is to check whether it's achieving macroeconomic goals in terms of budget deficit 
uh, and, and a variety of other sort of indicators of macroeconomic stability, because that's why we give the money through their budget. Second purpose is we sit down, we have a uh, series of meetings every year called the Shared Objectives Exercise, and we sit down with them and we define how our money shall be used. So of that 200 million, for example, we define that I think it's 56 and a quarter million um, will be used on education. Uh, another chunk gets used, 50 million for earthquake re recovery. Another chunk gets used for health. Um, and so we define with them together. And then we set indicators that are not just how our money will be used, but what they're going to do in that sector. Because the goal of our money is really to leverage their budget, make it possible for them to spend more and better on education. So even though directly our money of that amount, 56 and a quarter, may go into education this year, we're looking at indicators that say, are they increasing education as a percentage of GDP? Are they increasing the number of girls in school? Are they increasing the number of kids in school? And so are they meeting those overall targets for these different sectors? And that's the second way uh, we, we account for the money. So it's an output sort of a measure as opposed to identifying dollar for dollar where it actually gets spent. Yeah, yeah. Are, they, are we catalyzing, accelerating the work in sectors that are important to us? Uh, I, I was, had some statistics I can't put my finger on right now, but I think some of the, well, here it is. The, we're told by some of the witnesses that were here that um, the education budget of Pakistan is hovering somewhere around 2 percent of the uh, gross domestic product. And that that still falls. The UNESCO benchmark usually would recommend somewhere about 4 percent. Uh, are they moving and trending in the right direction here? They are. Uh, they spent $1.3 billion on education dollars in 2003. That was almost double to $2.4 billion by 2006. And they plan to continue uh, to double education and health expenditures as a percentage of gross domestic product by 2015. So that's what we're trying to do is support that effort. Yeah, I'm a little bit troubled with the, the way that we're accounting for this, only because we never seem to be able to nail down exactly that the money's been spent where we, we hope it is. You have those shared objectives, and then sort of if things look like they're trending somewhere, then we're satisfied, but we never get to see whether the, all of the $200 million goes uh, where we want it to go. Uh, and I would hope that we think of a better way to do that uh, at some point, which uh, is one of the reasons why we sort of went in um, when we did that bill, it took a little more money for yeah. education because we really feel strongly yeah. that education has to it gets more attention. How many USAID personnel that are focused on education are currently on the ground in Pakistan? I have to check on that. I don't. Okay. I don't know the number. I, I say that because off the record, uh, we heard one. You know, and that would be a little troubling. I think they'd need a larger presence. Uh, you know, in order to, to do something really meaningful on that and to make those numbers move in the direction in which. We want them to move yeah. and to, to send the message clearly that we expect more to happen there. There's, there's also one of the reasons we do some of this ourselves and some of it through the budget is because when we put the money into their budget and they're expanding education sent, uh, uh, sector, it can, it can do things like pay salaries for teachers, hire and train more teachers, um, buy books, providing lunch to kids in school. I mean, things that aren't really projects that we would carry out. Um, there are things that they can do as part of their education programs and expand, you know, use federal money to expand the availability of books and, and better curricula to the provinces and things like that. So the money goes to almost slightly different purposes than what we would spend directly ourselves in projects. Yeah. And it seems we have to do a, a, a little bit better job on tracking where that's going to. Right now the indications we have are that, you know, we're still a long, long way to go in terms of teachers and oh, we hear about the ghost schools and yep. the up opportunity there. And, and that's, I think, key to our long range issue yeah. of how we're going to deal with it, not just in Pakistan, yeah. but a whole host of different countries. What are we yeah. doing about providing good alternative education that, that doesn't push them back towards a sort of yeah. extremist uh, madrasa situation? I, I learned a long time ago in Africa when I was responsible for cold storage of vaccines in an aid project, you'd not only ask, do you have a refrigerator? You asked, yeah. do you have electricity? So when you, <laughs> exactly. when I was up in the in the tribal areas, you know, looking at some of these schools that we built with aid money, the question is, is the school done? Are there teachers? Are there books? And the answers are yes. We're careful uh, about a lot of that, and I agree with you that um, some of these specifics of 
you know, are we really, are they really expanding the availability of education as they spend more money are important to track as well. Well, when our recent visit up in the, uh, the, the Peshawar area and, and leading into the tribal areas there, we weren't convinced that you're very far along in putting this infrastructure together that you're going to need to really effectively spend the President's proposed program. So it may be that we need to take another trip out there before that all comes to fruition to see how that's going or whatever. I think the idea is good. Yeah. I think the idea is excellent. The question is, is yeah. it going to be executable? And, and, uh, and we'd like to work with you at least on that part. Can you give us a little rundown of what precautions the administration has taken to assure that the military support money is actually going to the types of military equipment and purposes that effectively fight international terrorism as opposed to some other purpose, uh, for instance, Orient submarines and uh, you know, F-22 bombers and things like that that might more uh, actively look like they're, they're, they're shoring up against India than fighting international terrorism? I think, sir, we, we do try to do both. I mean, we try to help. Pakistan with legitimate defensive needs, with its ability to patrol in the Arabian Sea. They've been part of NATO missions out there um, to provide maritime security in that area. Um, and so we do try to help them with their sort of basic defensive needs. And that's a chunk of our money. That's the, the pretty much what the $300 million for foreign military financing goes to is a lot of those kind of things. Uh, but it also, some of that money and, and other things that we do by um, uh, night vision goggles, body armor, you know, equipment for troops that are in the war on terror. And then in addition, then, you have the money that's the reimbursement for the expenses on the war on terror, and the, the Pentagon is in charge of getting receipts and making sure they know how that money is, is being spent in the right places. Yeah. I think there's a whole host of people here in, in uh, the Congress that think those numbers, you know, ought to be swayed a little bit differently. There ought to be more toward the international terrorism a action and, and less toward the general part of it, which they already have their military uh, designed and set up to do. But uh, we'll look at that as the budget comes through. Have you been had the opportunity to talk to uh, General McNeil uh, in terms of what he sees going on in terms of communicating what happens in his eyes of the cross-border movement between the Taliban from the Pakistani side to the Afghani side? Sure. Do you have regular meetings with him on that? Yeah. And other intelligence officials, what they tell, uh, talk about in terms of um, them giving intelli actual intelligence to the Pakistani side and either the cooperation or lack of cooperation that they get back uh, as a response to that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a little surprised that you're still as positive about what's being done if you're taking information of those two, because I've had conversations I, I've, in depth with, on a regular basis with those people, and I don't get a very pleasant position. Uh, I, I've talked to General McNeil. I think uh, the Dutch general, General Van Loon, was just uh, in Washington. I don't know if you saw him. He's been the general for uh, Regional Command South. Um, and, you know, he was saying there are things going on on the Pakistan side that are helpful, that are important to us. Uh, that's all I'm saying. I also know there's a regular flow of people across that the, the ability to take refuge in Pakistan and regroup and, and organize has been uh, a serious danger to our troops. And, and serious questions about people giving information of intelligence and have it not be acted upon. That then obviously puts our people in, in jeopardy on Nothing. that. And, and that's not an irregular situation. It's a fairly common occurrence, it, at least as was It's something that us. happens. And, and it is uh, an occurrence, and, and nothing ever quite happens as fast or effectively as we might like. Uh, but that doesn't mean you abandon the effort. That means you continue to make it better. Uh, just your last, in, in part, maybe some comments on the judicial situation that's going on over there. How do you see that uh, evolving and winding out? We've, we've said that everybody needs to respect the decisions of the judicial process. It is in there is a judicial process in Pakistan to handle these matters. Um, and uh, in the end, everybody needs to respect that and, and let those decisions be made in a judicial manner. Uh, in the meantime, there's a lot of demonstrations. A lot of the people I met uh, last time I was in Pakistan were, were out demonstrating and, and you know, uh, political parties are, are rallying. Uh, in part, it's just it's a reflection of the fact this is a very political year in Pakistan. Do we have any diplomatic uh, comments to make to President Musharraf when he sacked uh, Chief Justice Chowdhury? Um, we asked a lot of questions. Uh, we, uh, it, it, again, it's going to be up to the Pakistani judicial system to decide if the referral, it's called, the referred charges to a, another judicial body. 
uh, if the referral was warranted, and, and I think we've, we're we going to have to respect that process ourselves. Well, are, are we being firm and clear uh, in our comments to the Mishar of Government that we expect them to also respect the process? Uh, and, and let we, out? We've been very clear that everybody should do that, including the government, and that's what the government's pledged to do. You made some comments uh, in the Pakistani Times, I think it was last month, and you were talking about your belief that the media in, in Pakistan is free. So I thought that I'd like to ask you about your, uh, what you say about the recent reports about the government's detention of reporters, control over television coverage, and what appeared to many of us to be forms of intimidation that was initially started and, and pulled back eventually. How do you account for that? Uh, we've said it was a bad idea, and we're glad it was pulled back. And we think our comments probably had something to do with the fact that it was pulled back. And lastly, I think it's lastly, lastly, AQ Khan on that. There was a little bit of discussion there. Uh, now we're led to believe that he's under so-called house arrest, allowed to brunch and to have tea with friends and family. Um, is that accurate? Is that is between that laxly and what is the prospect? What is your confidence level that the Pakistani nuclear uh, secrets and materials are safe at this point? And what more ought Congress be doing to ensure the continued safety if they are? Um, I think we're confident that the uh, the con network is out of business, that we've been able to get at it in a lot of parts of the world, um, that he's no longer operating the kind of black marketing that he, that he was doing in the past. I think we're confident that Pakistani has, the Pakistan, Pakistan has good control over its nuclear materials, um, and it is something we keep a close eye on. Are we making efforts to uh, get in and question um, Mr. Khan? Because I'm sure that we must feel that he has significant information about other sales that he made prior to his detention, and they would be fairly useful to our efforts at nonproliferation. Um, we're always interested in inf getting information. Are we getting uh, any cooperation from him and from about the, his Mr. network? Mishar? We've gotten good cooperation in terms of the flow of information to us and to the IEA and to others around the world. From questioning of Mr. Khan or from other sources? From, uh, from Pakistanis and their questioning of Mr. Khan, yeah. But we've not been allowed access to him at, no. at this point. Mr. Basher, I want to thank you for all the time that thank you generously you, uh, gave us this morning and for your uh, candor and your answers and um, for your objectivity, I guess, although I might argue that, uh, again, that I would like to see I some more so. subjectivity into it. But I appreciate it very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, sir. On this morning's Washington Journal, The Washington Post Rajiv Chandrasekharan takes your calls on the White House Iraq report. Then Kimberly Strassel of The Wall Street Journal on relations between the Bush administration